everybody. Uh, this is a joint uh, meeting with the um, Senate Ag Committee as well as the House Ag Committee. And we're hearing uh, from the non-dairy uh, people in regards to um, situations that we might be able to correct in an amendment bill that we're uh, proposing uh, to try to help uh, more uh, non-dairy uh, mm -hmm. agricultural people to participate in our COVID-19 um, uh, relief funds. And um, we have um, a host of witnesses this morning uh, representing most of the major uh, players uh, dealing with non-dairy. Some also deal it within the dairy uh, business. Um, I think it's uh, real important to hear from you folks and for you folks to be sure and get to your membership um, and your different groups to really push them to apply for this, um, these grants because we certainly don't want to leave uh, money on the table. Uh, we want to get it out to the farmers and into the communities uh, to help them survive uh, this disastrous uh, time that we're in. So um, uh, we're gonna run uh, in like 15 minute blocks uh, with the different groups and uh, there'll be a couple of uh, speakers uh, within each group uh, and sometimes maybe only one but uh, we should have a little bit of time uh, for questions if, if they uh, arise and, um, and we'll just work through it like we do our meetings when we hold them in Montpelier, except for we can't see all of you at, uh, in the room, even though you know in our room, I can see almost as many on the screen as I can get in my room or our Senate <laughs> Ag room. So it isn't a whole lot different than being in Montpelier. Um, but Carolyn, did you have any comments that uh, you'd like to make uh, before we get started? Uh, thanks, Bobby. I just want to thank you all for including us in this meeting. I'm, I'm glad you put this together. We've been working on making our recommendation to the FY21 budget and just wrapped that up yesterday. So uh, I'm, I'm really glad that we get this opportunity to hear from folks and, and do it in a really um, efficient way. And so thanks for including us. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wanna miss you guys. I mean, you're, you know, you're a great help. And, uh, and we, uh, you know, working together, we can accomplish good things. And, if we work separately, sometimes it doesn't always work out as well. Right. So uh, glad, to, glad to have you uh, with us. Um, are there any other comments from any of the committee members uh, before we get started um, with our testimony? I don't see anyone that wants to have uh, anything to say. Um, and, you know, the only thing is we might miss you, but Carolyn's uh, Senator, uh, Representative Partridge is going to be watching for hands and Linda as well as myself. So we'll try not to miss anybody uh, if you have a question. Um, so I think to start with on our schedule, and I think you you all have a copy of the schedule that uh, we put together. <clears throat> um, and I think all the participants also have the schedule so they can kind of follow along and we'll try to, we'll try to stay in order if we can, but if somebody's missing, we may skip to the next one and then back up. Um, so uh, Maddie, uh, you're the first uh, member up this morning uh, and you're representing NOFA and uh, wanna welcome you to the hearing. 
Thank you, Senator Starr. It's really nice to see everyone. Um, and first of all, I just want to really thank all the committee members for um, being here. It's really great to have all the House and Senate members together for this. And I also really am so grateful to all the producers who made themselves available today um, during what I know is a really busy time of year. So um, thank you all so much for being here to, um, to discuss. Um, and I'll try to keep it brief because I want to hear more from farmers. Um, just to queue up sort of the issues um, that we'll be discussing today, I, um, I think you all received a copy of the letter that NOFA um, sent to legislators along with rural Vermont and seven um, agriculture and working lands organizations uh, earlier or well last month um, regarding some of the issues with the deadline and the eligibility for the non-dairy ag assistance program. Um, the first issue is that we're just basically requesting that the deadline be pushed back um, from the existing deadline of October 1st to at least November 1st to give folks more time to apply um, and to give the agency more time to get these funds out the door. Uh, and my understanding from you know hearing from folks at the agency is that they would be supportive of that um, because we really haven't had a lot of time, particularly with the non-dairy application uh, that just opened on August 19th um, to start getting applications in and getting funds out to farmers. So that's a hopefully a pretty simple request. Um, and I would you know hope that uh, your committees could prioritize, you know, working with appropriators to get that done um, sooner than later so we can make sure none of these funds have to be returned to the federal government. Um, and then secondly, the, the issue that we're here to talk about is the fact that um, the provision that was included in S-351 for the non-dairy program uh, that was not included for dairy or forestry businesses or agricultural fairs, um, which states that a farmer is not or a food producer is not eligible to apply for that program. Uh, and the $5 million in funding that was allocated to them if they had a net profit between March 1st and August 1st. Uh, and there are a couple issues with that. Um, you know, one is just that it's really not a helpful metric to determine profitability for the year on balance. It's really um, sort of an arbitrary time period that doesn't really give a good picture of whether a farm is going to be profitable for the year. Um, Ella Chapin testified to the Senate Ag Committee last week, so many of you heard this, but she gave what I thought was a really helpful example um, of a farmer, for example, who purchased, who made a large annual purchase, like their feed, um, during that time of year that would really change their profitability picture for those, uh, for those months as compared to a farmer who didn't have a similar annual expense during that time. Um, so we're just really concerned that it's, it, it isn't a helpful metric to determine profitability. We also just are really not clear as to why that provision was included for these non-dairy businesses, um, but it wasn't included for everyone. Um, you know, if the goal was to make sure that we're not giving money to people who are doing well, it's possible in my mind that there are both dairy farms and forestry businesses um, who could have been profitable during that time of year, but they are still eligible for assistance to cover their losses and their expenses under the same legislation. Um, and I'm sure you'll hear more from, from producers about that. Uh, you know, I, I spoke to a produce farm in Burlington several weeks ago who sells primarily to restaurants. Uh, and as you know, early in the pandemic, a lot of restaurants were forced to shut down and that caused significant losses to farmers um, across all different types of businesses who sell to restaurants from dairy to non-dairy. And, you know, Diane Bothfeld gave an example of a cheesemaker who sold primarily to restaurants who lost their markets. And they were able to, you know, amazingly, as so many farmers have done, pivot and set up a farm stand at their farm. And under the dairy assistance program, that cheesemaker is able to get those expenses covered, um, while a vegetable farmer who's in the exact same circumstance would not be able to get those same expenses covered just by virtue of being a vegetable farm. Um, so I thought that was kind of a helpful way to think about it. Um, and then just in terms of the application, I'll just say a couple more things. Uh, we are working to get the word out and actively encourage um, farmers and, and food producers to apply for this program, as Senator Starr suggested. That's, that's really important. And I think all of the organizations on this list are really actively engaging with our communities and, and helping folks with the application. Um, and in some ways, the fact that the agency combined the working lands funding, the 3.5 million from the two other bills with this 5 million from S-351 um, is great. It kind of expands the pot of funding that folks are, are theoretically eligible for, but it also unfortunately serves to kind of obscure this problem because when a producer goes to apply, 
um, they may be in fact eligible if they were profitable for that period of time, but it is likely because they're eligible for that working lands pot of funding that doesn't have this criteria attached to it. Um, and that pot of funding in working lands is actually a smaller amount. It's 3.5 million as opposed to 5 million. Um, it also has a higher cap. I think that the cap for each grant is 50,000 in that program versus 20,000 in S351. Uh, and both are first come first serve. So it means that this, the working lands funding, which has a higher cap and less strict eligibility um, might get used up really quickly. And then that 5 million that has this no net profit provision attached um, may not really be accessible. And we're concerned that folks aren't gonna be able to use it and it will we'll just sit there essentially. Um, the last thing I would just say is to, that I would encourage legislators to actually take a look at the application and see um, how this criteria is being included. My, my understanding is that it's basically a checkbox on the application. Um, so I think it's just important to think about that when we're considering you know, uh, the possibility of getting this changed. Uh, it would be great for legislators to take a look at the application and understand um, what it currently looks like um, in practice. Yeah. So and I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'll leave it to everyone else. Yeah. <clears throat> well, th uh, thank you, uh, Maddie. And um, we we worked on some of the issues that that you brought up uh, about fixing them. And uh, so it's a work in progress, and we're moving forward. Uh, is Jan Miller uh, with us? Yes, right here. Hey everybody, I'm gonna keep my camera on for introductions, but I'm operating with a, a hotspot right now. So then I'm gonna I'm gonna pop it off to ensure that I don't freeze up during my little spiel here. Here, um, for those of you I don't know, my name is Jen Miller. I run the Farmer Services Program at NOFA Vermont. So we're providing business planning and technical assistance to farms um, across the state, and we work with all different types of farms, um, both dairy and non-dairy. Uh, prior to becoming a service provider, I had extensive experience um, working on vegetable and diversified livestock farms. So I come at this with that perspective as well. So thanks for having me here. I'll try to keep it brief because Maddie said we really want to get to the to the farmers, but I want to try to set the stage with a little bit of testimony. So forgive me for having to turn off my camera while I talk. Yeah. Um, so I think that the Talking to a lot of different farmers, I think that the significant increased demand that we've seen for local food from vegetable fruit, livestock producers, has potentially skewed the perception about the financial health of these farms and their expected net profit at the end of the year. Um, I think in general, I'm going to I'll give some general examples. I'm going to let the farmers you're going to hear from provide the very specific examples because I want their stories to stick with you more. Um, but I want to make a few key points. So. I think most importantly, if a farm is cash flowing now, it does not mean that they are or will be profitable for all of 2020. Um, so the farms that you know that are benefiting from this increased demand for their products are also simultaneously incurring significant expenses that were not budgeted um, to ensure that they can do all they can to protect themselves, their employees, and their customers from COVID, and to pivot their marketing and distribution strategies to ensure the continued viability of their businesses. You know, I've talked to some larger farms here and you know, CSA packing, um, and they're incurring additional labor costs on the order of like $1,000 to $2,500 per week to cover additional handling, packing, distribution. Um, and it's, you know, no small feat, but I'll bring back, circle back around to why this is not going to work with, from this March to August timeline um, to really get a sense of where they're going to end up profit wise by the end of the year. Um, the increase in demand also means that like these farms, are not necessarily experiencing a cash flow cr crunch right now. I think that gives kind of a skewed impression to the general public that all, all will be well, but the impact of these additional expenses will likely mean that they end the year with significantly reduced profit than otherwise projected. Um, we're also entering the fall and winter, and it seems very likely that there's gonna be more investments and innovations required of these farms to ensure the safe distribution of their food in challenging weather environments. For example, they're not gonna be able to rely on their outdoor locations to drop off their vegetables. Um, all these creative solutions that have served people really well um, are gonna take more investment to make sure that they continue their sales increase over the course of the winter. 
um, especially if farmers markets can't move indoors. And so the way that, you know, th those expenses are not, you know, they're going to come September, October, they're not going to be encompassed in this profitability window either. Um, the way that this bill is written additionally means that if a farm, you know, that usually nets, you know, $50,000 in profit, if they're, you know, if they get down to $10,000 in profit, they still don't qualify for assistance, which sets them up for a cycle of struggle. There's not going to be enough left over for family living, debt services, and startup costs for 2021. Um, so I will end with a few examples of why this March to August window claiming a net loss is not going to give an accurate picture of profitability for the year. Um, so looking at, you know, these are just general examples again hopefully going to set the stage for the farmers that are following because they're going to hit all these different categories um so you know csa farm they're going to accrue the bulk of their expenses january to march then sign up the bulk of their customers april to june talking about vegetables here um expenses are clearly not going to be offset with the income in the period identified in the bill grass-fed beef winter feeding boarding expenses incurred january to april feed expenses will go down when animals go out in pasture in may and they may have, based on their sales model, they may have increased summer sales, you know, at farmers markets through the through the summer months. Um, again, expenses are not going to be offset by income to be able to have them show a net loss and qualify. Maple expenses, including the vast majority of labor, incurred January to March, with sales starting in March and April. Um, you know, there's also the example thinking through, like, was similar to what Ella had said I've had a couple of farms, like one farm happened to invest in a new delivery truck February to March, February. Um, you know, Farm B, which we had a recipient of one of our resilience grants to purchase, help purchase a delivery truck in May as a COVID response distribution strategy. Farm B might qualify, be able to show that net loss because they purchased the truck. They happened to purchase their truck in May. Farm A, same expense. Um, but they purchased it too early to become to be examined in that net profit window. Um, so I could go on with some more examples. I'm happy to take questions, but I think all told, it's not a logical clause to include in the bill. And my hope is that it can be removed to support as many of these farms as possible. Yeah. Uh, thank thank you, Jan. Um, any questions? If not, we'll move on to Ryan. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, my name is Ryan Fitzbeauchamp, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak uh, to the committee. Um, uh, my wife, Kara, and I run Evening Song Farm. We're a diverse vegetable farm. I've been in operation since 2011. Uh, we have four acres of vegetable production and about 10,000 square feet of high tunnels that we use for winter greens production. We have full, four full-time seasonal employees, and our farm nets about two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars in gross sales annually. Uh, so I just want to paint a little picture of how um, of our farm and how it has how we've responded to COVID, and um, and specifically talking about ways for our farm that the um, metric for evaluating net profitability. Uh, doesn't give an accurate picture of our farm's annual profitability. Um, I think a lot, and a lot of it will be um, emphasizing points that Jen made. Uh, I think one of the biggest ones is where a lot of, where almost all of our non the, the timing for almost all of our non labor expenses, things like seed and fertilizer and equipment, uh, greenhouse supplies, uh, packaging supplies, most of these we purchased in uh, December through January. Uh, December through February um, at the beginning of the year, um, and um, and then the timing of our income as well. Uh, since before before COVID, almost all of our marketing um, or the bulk of our marketing was through farmers markets. Um, since COVID, uh, we've stopped. We've discontinued both of our farmers markets and instead uh, doubled the size of our CSA responding to demand from that. So that means that for this year, uh, we've had um, about 50% of our farm's income uh, comes in the months of March through May uh, for those summer CSA signups. Um, so our farm's 
expenses are, are heavily skewed to um, the late fall, early winter months, and our income is skewed uh, to, to the summer months. Um, so the, the months of, of March through August would, would give an inaccurate picture of our farm's overall profitability. Um, I think the other question that I have as, as a non-dairy producer is, um, is it's unclear to me why the profitability uh, restriction uh, would apply to, uh, would apply only to, to non-dairy farm operations um, and not also to uh, forestry or, or dairy operations. Um, our farm, I don't know yet if our farm will uh, be profitable this year or not. We've been able to um, switch a lot of our marketing and uh, capitalize on a lot of interest in local food, but we've also incurred a lot of expenses to um, uh, to upgrade our facilities here to uh, greatly expand our CSA distribution um, in response to dropping farmers markets. Um, so, um, so I, I don't know yet if we'll be profitable, um, but uh, but it has been very challenging to adapt to these changes, and um, uh, and I think that's that's all I have to share with you. I appreciate your time very much. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, are there any questions from the committee members? If uh, not, uh, we'll move on to uh, the Vermont Sheep and Goat uh, Association. And uh, Dave uh, Martin, are you with us? I'm, I'm here, can you hear me? Yeah, loud uh, and clear. Uh, technology is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I just uh, want to appreciate the time and energy and effort you folks are putting into uh, uh, to taking this testimony today. And I, I do understand that there are some really complex issues and, and that need attention. And I just appreciate your effort to, to, uh, to do this. Uh, I'm president of the Vermont Sheep and Goat Association, uh, mostly small members, but many of our members uh, have uh, agricultural enterprises that are, are small scale, but are, are genuine in their effort to, to, to make a few bucks. Uh, my main product is is lamb. I sell lamb, and one of the issues uh, that it impacts me uh, from COVID uh, is an issue that started before COVID. Uh, I used to have a, a fairly good deal in in uh, I had a, a steady market for my lambs. I used to sell like 140 lambs a year, and and distribution and handling was all taken care of. And then this, the processing facility I used uh, announced that it would no longer process lambs because as the manager told me, any day that he uh, processes pigs as, as opposed to processing lambs, he makes 50% more money. So if he can fill his day up doing pigs, he makes money, he makes more money than he does processing lambs. And it was a purely a dollar and cents business decision. I have no ill will towards him. He's running a business and from a business perspective, it makes no sense for him to spend a day doing lambs when he can spend that day doing pigs. So I lost that really dependable, well-paying market. And uh, I've struggled to replace it. And one of the issues I tell folks is I have no, there's no issue with my being able to sell my lambs. I absolutely know I have a market for my lambs. The issue I have is how much will I get for them? That's that's the crunch. And last year, I started to sell lambs out of my freezer. I got a license from the state, a freezer in my garage. And I learned that I was able to make a pretty good return. Uh, I was really surprised. I made uh, about uh, my, my investment and how much money I was able to make. And I had planned to do that again this year. Uh, however, when I called in to schedule uh, my lands for processing, uh, I could not a, get a date. Uh, and I think I'm scheduled now for January 21st is when I, I can take my lambs in. And right. part of that is my fault. I should have called earlier because I know there's always a, a, a crunch, uh, but I thought I was calling early enough. 
COVID-19 really changed that. Uh, so that market, I mean, I haven't, I, I will not have the lamb to sell out of my home. So that's a, that's a, a loss of money to me. And I've heard from three other VSG members who have reported the same issue uh, that uh, slaughterhouses they, that they've dealt with for years no longer want to do lambs. Because I think at the end of the day for a, a, a slaughtering facility is how many pounds of meat are hanging on the hook. And uh, if, if a slaughterhouse can fill up their, their time doing beef and pork, that's what they're going to do. Again, nothing personal. It's just a purely business decision. Uh, so that's one of the things I, I, I struggle with. And I, don't know, I do not know what the solution is, uh, but I see that as a, a real issue uh, for me as, as, a, as a land producer. Uh, some <laughs> other members have, have develop systems where they can uh, they they process the the wool into fiber and sell the yarn and sell uh, knitted products and and I think sometimes folks lose sight of the fact that wool and yarn is also an agricultural product and and it is part of the agricultural economy and I and I, I, I most people probably aware that in in the middle of the, the 19th century uh, there was more wool more money made on wool in Vermont than dairy by far. Uh, and that has ch has changed over the years. And the one VSGA member uh, expected to lose between eight and $10,000 because the sheep and wool festival is, was canceled and Rhinebeck was canceled. And those two events uh, generated a fair amount of her income. And, and because of COVID-19, that income is gone. And so she's having to struggle to come up with alternatives for that. And, and that's it's pretty much uh, my testimony. Does anybody have any, any questions for me? Uh, well, yesterday, uh, Dave, uh, our committee uh, had Ellen uh, Keller, Keller uh, in for um, testimony and how things were going um, there with them and we got into the processing of meat uh, quite deeply and it seems that we actually need a couple of more processing uh, facilities or could use a couple of more processing facilities uh, in in Vermont here and I you know we just heard this yesterday and, but it's something that we're really gonna have to deal with, I would hope in this next legislative session. Uh, and it, it costs a lot to put a processing plant in, you know, where is it gonna be located? What type of animals are they gonna be able to uh, harvest uh, or slaughter? Uh, so we've got a lot of issues. We a few years back, as you probably know, we we did prop up the processor uh, slaughterhouses and and uh, did quite a lot to encourage them to expand and grow and and uh, but we've heard that you know this summer that the dates have gotten pushed out so far that you know beef cattle can't be processed. Um, chickens as an issue there, as well as, of course, sheep and, and goats. So um, it's something that we as a group, all of you folks that are on the, on the hearing today to testify along with the two ag committees has got to work trying to develop um, a procedure and, and help for uh, a more advanced uh, processing facility that should be able to handle all types of our agricultural animals. Uh, Carolyn? Uh, thanks, Bobby. I, you know, we just uh, developed our letter of recommendation for 
our uh, appropriation committee and I'm about to send it if all of my committee members get back to me, guys. <laughs> um, uh, at any rate, um, as a sheep farmer myself and somebody who relies on those, you know, the sheep and wool festivals and the sale of lamb, I can really understand what Dave's saying. But one of the things we included was uh, a request that, uh, as you probably know, the governor's budget, his recommend, was set the working lands uh, enterprise initiative back to $594,000. Uh, there's a lot of money in there for COVID related things, but COVID related uh, does not include large infrastructure. So for this ongoing problem. So um, we requested, and we know that things are really tight. We know that the, um, the balancing point is with the state colleges. We appreciate that. But we, uh, we also understand that the slaughterhouse situation is a huge problem, as is, for that matter, the processing facilities for the wood, wood products. So we included that in our letter of recommendation that if at all possible, they find uh, a, some more money for the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. So we hear you. We've heard some of that testimony, too. And... Um, you know, hopefully we'll, you know, by some miracle, we'll be able to find some, some dollars for the, for the, you know, base working lands projects. Yeah, I would like to. Yeah. Dave? Yeah, I would just like to say in, in terms of uh, a land processing facility or small ruminant, it, it's, it's not enough just to have that facility. I think work needs to be done in terms of ensuring that there is a supply of product to that facility, of high quality product that producers have to have support to produce a consistent high quality product to provide to the processor because the processor is just one piece of, of, the, of, the, of the system. There's the, the producer, the processor, the person who does the aggregation and distribution. There are a lot of small producers in Vermont uh, and the, I would like to see a system that sort of helps aggregate numbers to to of high quality product to bring into a processor, and then a system to help get that product out out to New England and New York, which is a, which is a really great market for lamb uh, and and goat. And, but it, it, there has to be part. It has to be part of a system. And as we, I, I think in the past. A, there was a grant to put it, create a small ruminant line at the Royal Butcher uh, for, for lamb and goats, and that operated for a while, but, but that, that has closed down. And, and I think one of, one of the problems was that the enable to provide a, a consistent high quality product to the processor. Uh, so I, I, I just want to put a, a, a plug in for that. And, and I also that the farm to plate and and our agency of agriculture are working on uh, uh, lamb, lamb and goat production. Oh, that, that's a, an ongoing issue there. Thank you. Bobby, yeah. can you see the little blue hands? Um, I have no, two there, committee members. There are house members and I don't see them. Okay, um, so, well, no, if you're I, a co-host, you should see them. So I, Sharon's I, hand is up, John Bartholomew is up, and so is Senator Pearson, so, uh -huh. Sharon. Uh, Bay, uh, you're, uh, you had your hand up first, I believe. Okay. Um, is that, that did, no, I okay. think Bay, Bay Hammond had her oh, hand up too. I am, um, I'm here also representing Vermont Sheep and Goat Association with Dave, and I want to thank Dave so much for addressing a huge issue that is ongoing and even heightened with this COVID issue. But I also wanted to kind of bring back a little bit and focus on what the members are experiencing now in direct relationship to the COVID because I don't want to lose sight of that either. And I have, um, what I did was I have a, um, a kind of a description of what a member sent to us as far as what she's experiencing, experiencing this year due to the COVID. And I thought I would just take you through that timeline to kind of get a, an idea of how that is and affecting folks. Um, is it possible, if, Bobby, is it possible for folks who had questions for Dave to get their questions answered and then to have Bay give her presentation? How would you like to yeah. do that? 
Yeah, I thought Bay had a question and that's why I called on her. <clears throat> um, um, we'll, we'll back up to, um, is it Shannon that yeah. had Sorry. her hand up next? We'll get back to you, Bay. Thank you, Senator Starr. <laughs> Always good to see you again. Um, I, I guess my question is, I'm thinking about, um, you know, Vermont Technical College or some of our agricultural support infrastructure um, from an educational perspective, maybe UVM Extension. Is there any way to stand up a, um, a, a program that would provide some slaughter and processing. And I, I, I realize that this is thinking outside the box quite a bit, but if there is a program and I'm, I'm exposing some of my ignorance about whether or not that exists, is there a way for us to, to, to do that now so that we don't end up with a whole bunch of sheep and goat farmers that are really stuck going into the winter with, in a bad hay year with livestock they weren't able to process, um, you know, with a lot less hay than they need to get through what they would have normally had in the barn over winter. Um, well, we do have a meat uh cutters training program at VTC. Um, I don't know if that would include training for slaughterhouse people, but I know slaughter slaughterhouse owners try to hire meat cutters to work in their facilities. So we do have that program. Um, and I, we heard that well, I knew it was there and we heard about it again yesterday, but uh, we didn't get a report on how many students say they have had uh, go through the program. So we're, we're still checking on that to right. uh, move forward. And I could see with the infrastructure already there, because it's expensive to set up a meat cutting operation that maybe it could be rented out. Um, so that it's functioning full time um, instead of just on student schedules. Just, just a thought. Yeah, thank you. John? Uh, just commenting on the profitability of slaughterhouses and the, the way they work. One of the issues that um, has come up for our farm is when you're dealing, dealing with small ruminants and also swine, Everyone wants to do their slaughter after the end of the summer season when the animals are coming off pasture. And that's one of the roadblocks I've always run into is there are just so many animals. It's not just a profitability thing. And even if you're using a, a private type or a, I mean a, small, a, a more um, specialized processor like Green Mountain Smokehouse, then you're competing with all the, de all the deer that are coming in from the hunters. So I don't know, is there any any solution to that timing other than overwintering animals and paying for hay? It seems like an almost a, the, the, like there's no solution to me to, to deal with that, that glut of animals in the fall. Uh, I, I don't know, unless we can change the weather, yeah. um, how that's going to happen. Maybe yeah. global warming will yeah. take care of that. Yeah. Uh, this, they, no, this, this is... This is Dave. Dave. Uh, one of the issues with lamb is 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 a seasonality, which is the nature of lamb. And lambs are born in the spring; they're ready for the market in the fall. There are some breeds of sheep that will breed out of season, uh, and you can have a lamb ready for market at, a, at other times of the year. Uh, that requires a pretty major change in how you manage your sheep, and uh, you tend to not have as many lambs. Uh, but you get a much better price because the, the market price for lamb is higher uh, when there aren't as many lambs around. But that, but the, the seasonality of lamb uh, is, is certainly certainly an, an issue, a struggle, um, which is why I think it needs to be part of a system, and, and every, every part of the system needs to understand how they interact with the others, and need to create a system so that everybody in it, everybody makes a few bucks. Uh, and and and, sh and, sh and shares a pr a pr in, in the process. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, Chris Pearson, Senator Pearson. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm running around today, so I can't be on video. 
can't hardly hear you. Um, hold on. Can you hear me now? A little, little. How bit. about now? Hey, oh, How about we, now? There we go. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm running around today, so I, I can't be on video, but I'm listening closely. And I wonder if it would be appropriate to ask uh, Representative Partridge, you mentioned your letter to a probes. Um, as we've talked about it in Senate Ag, we're all, I think it's fair to say, comfortable with this uh, removing the, the net profitability clause on the application. And that, that seems pretty important to me, certainly, and I think to, to our committee. And I'm wondering if that's, if it'd be fair to ask uh, if that's part of your recommendation as you're sending it over to, uh, to a, a bill that might tweak you know, might move fast. That's what we've been talking about is how to how to get that done and done quickly. And I wonder if your committee is comfortable with that idea. So Chris, we we were really just asked to make recommendations about amounts of money or places where we could add some money and not so much for policy. Um, what one of the things I think we really have, I'm not opposed to this and in the interest of full disclosure, I just uh, submitted my application for one of these grants yesterday. Um, I think one of the one of the difficulties is <clears throat> how this is going to work because uh, a number of people and I don't know the number off the top of my head of uh, people have have reply uh, have submitted their grants, you know, based on the no net profitability between March first and August first. I'm not necessarily opposed to it, but then. It's, I just think it's complicated in terms of how you figure this. You want money to go to people who have had losses or expenses um, and, and have ultimately, I would say, lost. And, and that might be a question you want to discuss. But, um, uh, you know, and, and in terms of somebody asked a question about why, <clears throat> why was this included? And it wasn't included in the dairy and the forestry. Well, in dairy, we knew the original proposal was for a big chunk of money for dairy. We knew that the farmers had all taken a hit, you know, maybe uh, organic was doing a little bit better, but everybody uh, who was doing conventional dairy had taken a huge hit in their milk checks and were getting paid uh, way lower than uh, the cost of production. So, so I, I think we need to have a discussion about how exactly this works. If they change the parameters of this grant, then do, you know, does everybody have to reapply? Um, part of the concern, and I don't have a problem with moving the date to November 1st. Uh, I, and I'm not speaking for my committee, I'm just t telling you how I feel about it. Um, but part of the, the challenge here is that this COVID money needs to be dispersed and spent by the end of December. So, um, you know, I'm all ears and I'm willing to listen and I understand the, the situation because I'm in this boat myself, um, taking a huge hit, losing the, um, the sheep and wool festivals. But um, at any rate, I, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, if we can come up with a solution, I'm, you know, I'm happy to talk about it and consider it. But in turn, the, the direct answer to your question is no, we didn't include that because we don't have the details. I mean, this is the first discussion we've had about this and I think it's complicated. Uh, Chris, are you all set? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, what our answer is to that uh, issue, um, Carolyn, and for the members that are listening, we talked the uh, non-dairy uh, and working lands has been put together. And our simple solution that we've talked about in our committee is to move <clears throat> some of the money that's in, in um, the non-dairy section to working lands. And then the applicants, at, as they come into the ag agency, if if they're, that profit deal does not work in working lands, that's not a criteria. So then they just move the application over to the working lands portion 
of that joint program and everybody uh, is, is allowed in. So that, that's just a quick tip. So, so let me respond to that, Bobby. If you do check that, you know, that you have had a profit and they bounce you over to the working lands um, part of the application, I believe this is true, that you need to have an employee. So all sole proprietors get bounced out. We, I don't think we have any employees, but we can check that out. You know, once we get by the hearing here today, uh, we'll. That's a good note that we'll check. Well, out. this is what this is what I heard from Andrea Stander, and she's up in t at ten o'clock, so we can listen to her then. Yeah, um, Bay, we we should get back to you because we're using up your time. Well, I think Ruth had her hand up, but. Oh. Uh, yes, I guess she did. Ruth? That's okay. I can wait for after Bay, and then I'll ask my question of both Bay and Dave. It's okay. Fine. Th Bay has been waiting patiently. Yeah, well, that's thanks. okay. I just didn't want to get left out without um, coming to the table with something anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, no. um, but um, and I'm, it's, it'll be quick, and uh, it's reiterating a lot of what Dave and you all have been talking about. Of course, slaughterhouses are, are a big um, kind of crunch point for many of the small ruminant um, farmers here, from, from those farmers that have five in their backyard to those farmers that have a couple hundred in their backyard. It doesn't matter. Um, some folks have to ship their sheep out of state to get processed, and some just ship them in general to get rid of them this spring. Um, but one particular member that kind of kind of put it all together to me in a nice timeline. And this particular member had, um, she does a, a specialty product of sheep sausage with her call use in the spring. And she had a slaughter date set up and ready to go in May that got um, canceled, not from her, but from the processor. So that date was uh, canceled and she was stuck with a lot of call use that she couldn't keep going. She couldn't feed, you know, and make that profitability. It would suck up all the profitability of the farm. So she did ship those animals and took a 50% hit on the profit that she would have gotten from the sausage. It also gave her no product to take to market, um, to the farmer's <laughs> market, which is where she usually gets her income from. She does do um, an extra income with that sausage of yarn products and wool products. But with, they do not sell well in the spring and hot summer days, especially this past summer in a farmer's market. So they opted not to do the farmer's market at all and took that hit. Um, they did live off their savings and they made maybe, um, I think their sales, I think she said her sales were about 20 to, well, maybe it was 50% down in that time of the year with, their, with anything. And then going into the fall, so their main income comes in August, September, October um, through the festivals and the markets at that time where people are looking for those wool and yarn projects and um, fiber, and also where she can sell more of her sausage and meats. Um, she again does not have that sausage and meat, but she does have the yarn, but the, uh, the festivals that normally she would attend in New York and Vermont have all been canceled and gone on to virtual festivals which means she's expecting that she'll only make eight to 10% of her total income as what she did last year. So that, fa that family who lives off the farm income is looking at taking, is currently living off savings and whatever small income can come from those sheep. And so it's for her to say right now, this is how much I'm making for the year or not. It doesn't happen and it's too seasonal. Um, the product of going into um, this kind of farm or any diversified farm is more of a seasonality thing, which folks have mentioned already. And um, yeah, and so going forward, I'm not sure. I think also I want folks to realize that um, when dairy farms go out, there's, they become something else. And I'm by, you know, part of my day job is supporting and, and being with dairy farmers. Um, I work for VOF, so I work closely aligned with dairy farmers and by no means am I wanting to get rid of any of them. But they, we just down the street from me, there was two dairy farms that did go out on a conventional, well, I'm not sure if they were conventional, but they went under last year. And there has been a family that moved, bought the, per, bought the property, um, is now setting up, um, it's acres and acres. I think it was like a $2 million purchase. They came from out of state. They have four children and they're setting up um, a sheep farm. And then uh, there's another farm just down the road from, actually there's two farms down from the road from me that have increased their sheep production, I think two or three folds in the last couple of years. So this is not kind of a fad or it's, I just want to really 
press home that the small ruminant isn't something that's going to disappear. It was once a really mainstay of Vermont, and we may find that with the decline of the dairy farms, this may become another really great enterprise for Vermont. I think time focused on it and funds put towards it is just really important. And then to take these, you know, the um, what's happening now with these sheep farmers is a really good um, time to really kind of see what's indicative of the future and where our needs are, where, where the pressure points are. So that's it. Uh Talk fast enough. Uh, thank you, Bay. Uh, where where are those new uh, farms being set up? Um, Addison County, you know the Addison. the land of clay and pasture and grazing. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's good, and it's important to know where the numbers are if we're going to talk about additional slaughter facilities. Where you know where they should be built. Uh, and where it's convenient for you all know, to get to and all that. So thanks, thanks a lot. One, uh, one, mention, one mention too on the slaughter facilities that um, a member brought to point, which made good sense because this conversation goes around a lot on the listserv of ESGA as you know, Dave has, um, has talked to and is that the next processing facility for sheep should really be looked at uh, or the next processing facility should really be looked at um, building a processing facility for uh, goat and lamb for small ruminants. And Mary Lake has testified to the fact that the large ruminant processing facilities just are not set up for small ruminants. And so part of the cost is the fact of the inefficiency of it. And so if you have an infrastructure set up for small ruminants, you get a much better, more efficient system and therefore they can make more money and perhaps not charge as much on the other end to the farmer. Because right now it costs anywhere from, depending on where you go, 100 to $135 per lamb or per goat. It doesn't matter how much they weigh, it's just per animal going through. And so once you get 25 or 30 pounds of finished meat back, you can figure how, you know, and as from the farmer perspective, what you've got to charge in order to make money. Um, so I think that's something to consider is if you build a processing unit specifically for the animal that needs that processing unit, that maybe we can create some efficiencies that will cut back on the expense for the farmer. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Ruth, you had a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, and this is either for um, Bay or Dave. Um, we talked to, we've talked about uh, meat processing and wool for small ruminants. Um, and I'm just wondering if your members have had luck, um, success with applying for actually for the dairy um, portion of the program that we set up. We, we made sure to include sheep and goat dairies in the dairy, thing, in the dairy grants. And I know we're not talking about that today, but just quickly, if you know of people who have applied and been successful at getting their application approved and getting that money for sheep and goat dairies or sheep sheep and goat cheese processors? I don't know. I'm not sure Dave may be able to speak to this. Um, we don't have as many goat uh, dairy um, members as we do meat and fiber. Um, the cheese council holds a lot of those members. Um, but I did ask Dave about that last night. We talked a bit. So I don't know, Dave, if you have any more. To I, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, any VSGA members who have applied for the sheep or goat dairy. Um, okay. I did talk to several uh, goat farmers in June when we were setting all of this up who were interested in applying. So I can circle back with them, but I just wanna make sure that those farmers are taking advantage of that program because we were explicit in making sure they were included. Um, so I, I will check with them, but if you can check with your members to make sure that those who would qualify are applying, that would be, that would be great, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Ruth. Um, we'll uh, we'll move on to the uh, Vermont Grass Farmers uh, Association. Bruce, are you with us? I am. I am with you, and I will join you by video here. Yeah. Thank you. Great. I think I'll show you by video. There you go. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for. Uh, all your hard work in, in responding to these unusual times and um, really, really appreciate um, the, all, all the efforts that you're making. Uh, so my, my statement is really reflective of many of the other statements that have been made. We are, um, I, I'll, I'll uh, also, you know, uh, 
disclose that I finished my application last night. And I guess the first thing that I'll say is that um, that application, the application itself is going to be a barrier to entry for, I think, many farmers. I found it exceedingly um, difficult to navigate uh, well, especially with the uploads of documents that, that people are looking for. And uh, I was able to complete it, but it took, uh, it took quite a lot. It took a lot, quite a lot of uh, computer savvy, which um, I thought I had before I started, but, uh, but it was extremely difficult for me. Um, so uh, I agree, many people in the Vermont Grass Farmers Association, many members are, are folks that are doing grass-fed beef. And, um, and those folks are, have entered into a, a time right now, particularly starting in May, when they're grazing their cattle and not buying hay. And uh, that that is a that's a that's a time when especially when we've seen increased uh, local local buying sales for Vermont grass farmers that uh, that that they may be seeing a month to month uh, a net profit during that time. But then when they get into uh, you know af after November or so when they're not going to be grazing anymore, they get into much higher costs and they end up not being very uh, profitable for the year. Um, I think also each of those folks, many of those folks have had to pivot from one, uh, you know, from, from a business model that was working more on a wholesale basis uh, to, some, uh, to a, a model that was more focused on direct to consumer um, sales. And that's, that's been exceedingly difficult. We were certainly involved uh, because we had just installed uh, something like that for our farm. We were involved with bringing in other uh, grass-fed beef producers to help, uh, to help them sell on our site, or we were buying directly from them to keep our uh, site supplied because many, many of us, and uh, I think, uh, I think this would be true for pretty much all members were quickly running out of product early in the pandemic and had trouble keeping keeping inventory and supply on hand. Lots of costs involved, lots of additional costs involved with that. Um, so I think it's very difficult to know the condition of any, any farm right now uh, as they move forward through the end of the year without... Um, you know, it's very difficult to know whether they're pro whether whether they're going to be profitable or not, given all the changes in conditions. Um, so I, I just put that out there. Uh, I certainly hope that I don't have to do another application. <laughs> so, um, ho hoping that that uh, hoping that any changes that are made are not do not require re reapplication process for farms that have already applied. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Bruce. <clears throat> Are there questions for Bruce from any of the committee members? Um, if not, um, uh, we'll move on to, is it Nikhail? It's Nico Horster. Hi. Uh, I'm also on the board of the VGFA, Nico, yes. And I own a company called Shire Beef in Berkshire, Vermont. We are a grass-fed beef producer. We supply restaurants, uh, or did exclusively pretty much supply restaurants, Skinny Pancake, Worthy Burger, and a few others. Um, our sales went from 97, 95 to 97% wholesale to absolutely zero within about 10 days. Um, when this all started, we had uh, to hire an extra person to deal with orders. We had to implement a whole new software program to deal with credit card sales. And we went from three wholesale orders every two weeks to about 40 or 50 orders a week. Um, so completely different fulfillment inventory tracking, different cut lists, wholesalers buy different cuts than retail uh, customers do. You know, we had boxed beef uh, for stew. We had whole chuck rolls. This is not something you're going to take home and put in the oven. It's 30 pounds of chuck. Um, so we had to discount our backlog of uh, commercial inventory to get rid of it. 
you know, and again, the, the stipulation of proving what uh, my profitability status is month to month is impossible. We are a seasonal business, as Bruce just pointed out, in that uh, the, the the heavy aggregation of costs all comes over winter. And so if you're looking at a window from May to, to July, it's completely unrealistic to, to want a producer to be able to prove profitability or not. It's simply not possible if you're not on an annualized basis of your cost accounting. And so if I exclude the costs uh, of winterizing and of overwintering animals, and you know it takes two years to get a beef animal to slater, slaughter status, um, you know, so my invested cost in an animal goes two years back and to, to have to prove whether that was profitable in May or not is impossible. It's just not realistic. And, um, I, you know, I've heard this from a variety of other producers. And then to exacerbate the situation is now we have a market which has been very fickle, by the way, as soon as the stores back opened back up, our direct retail customer sales plummeted while the restaurants were still closed by the order of the governor and then slowly the restaurants are opening again but nowhere near to the to the capacity of demand that we had before COVID hit so now we're sort of in a limbo state in between where the consumers are happily shopping at the supermarket the restaurants are not operating at anywhere close to full capacity and uh, so now we're struggling we're actually having the most struggle in terms of our, our, our processes right now Thank God for farm stands and CSAs. They're uh, keeping us in, in in a reasonable cash flow right now. But in you know again speaking to profitability, and then uh, you know the the whole remarks that uh, Dave Martin uh, brought up earlier in Bay as well about slaughterhouses. Um, there's no quick fix. This is something that the state has neglected for for a decade, and it's coming home to roost. And we will have to have a better plan to get infrastructure that is accessible and uh, appropriate for different producers you know somebody said oh yeah and we have a meat cutting program at BTC well that ended in 2016 there have been workshops in 2019 at BTC about meat cutting but there's no targeted uh, apprenticeship program in the state of Vermont that uh, gives us the the skill sets um you know why are we surprised that we see immigrant labor well they're the ones who know how to sh cut sheep and goats um and uh you know we we you know, we're in the fortunate position that we have a regular slaughter date uh, schedule, uh, you know, every couple of weeks to get animals processed. But even with that, uh, we cannot get any slaughter dates for the next three months. So I'm stuck with the inventory that I have as of uh, September 15th all the way to mid-January. And so even if I could capture sales, I can't, I, I can't produce more sales. I have animals. I can't send them to slaughter because everything is booked out. Uh, and that is with the privilege of having being a regular customer of slaughterhouse, and you know, being that being acknowledged, just because there's such an inflood of uh, you know homesteaders who want to slaughter their three pigs and you know one sheep that they have for the season. Thank you. So, um, so you're having trouble getting into slaughter facilities as well as everyone else, and even though you have certain dates set up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I, I can't keep up with the demand. I can't increase anything. And in any case, the next three months are, are, are lost in terms of that just because there's no capacity. And then, yeah, there's other issues with slaughterhouses that where, you know, the inspectors are overreaching and, and making our lives more complicated at this point. That doesn't really need to be happening. But that's right. for another discussion. Carolyn? Um, Nico, could you say the name of your business and where it's located again, please? Yes, absolutely. My business is called Shire Beef LLC, and we're located in Versher, just south of Chelsea in Orange County. Great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. And any other questions? If John, did you have a question? John O'Brien? No. Um, there are no other questions. Thank you. Oh, it looks like your... Bruce. It looks like Bruce has something he wants to say. Ruth. Bruce. Bruce Hennessy. Oh, uh, go ahead, Bruce. I just wanted to share quickly who we are. I, I neglected to do that. You know, 
I have a I have a hard time in front of such illustrious company. Um, <laughs> well, you have, shouldn't uh, uh, you shouldn't uh, be uh, shy uh, at all. Okay, <laughs> I, I um we I just wanted to just to mention that we're Maple Wind Farm. We are both a a, a farm that well we produce 100% grass fed beef. We produce a pasture raised pork and primarily pasture raised poultry, uh, broilers, uh, layer hens for eggs and, uh, and turkeys, all on past daily move pasture. Um, and we have a very small USDA poultry processing plant. So we are kind of deep within all of these issues on the livestock side that is non-dairy. And, uh, and I will say that while um, our sales absolutely exploded and we, happen to be lucky enough to just be starting a direct to consumer effort to try to move away from wholesale and towards direct to, uh, direct to consumer that while we have received in amazingly spectacular new sales, um, we still remain uh, not profitable for this time period um, yeah. because of the massive expense, uh, expenses we've incurred through having to hire additional staff and make sure we can continue to operate even if people have to miss due to even one symptom for COVID, they have to stay home and get tested and that can be a four to six day process. And, and, I, and, uh, and we've had to invest a lot in our infrastructure to keep our staff safe. So I just wanted to add those two things. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bruce. Uh, John, did you have a representative, uh, do you have a do you question? Have Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, um, just quickly, Nico, did you apply for the non-dairy relief like Bruce did and, and run into a, a very difficult application? No, I did not uh, apply, John, because I have no way of ascertaining profitability for this time period in the way we do our accounting. I, you know, we do an end, end of the year accounting. I can look at my cash flow and I could potentially you know, spread out my winter feeding costs over all months and get to a profitability. But with the profitability clause in there, it is very clear to me that I will have a very hard time documenting that uh, at this point of the year. And the jury is out what's going to happen for the next three months. And I think that that is really where we're sort of the, where we hit into the trouble that, you know, what we might experience is good cash flow and good sales, as Bruce just point, pointed out, with in massively increased costs and how that all shakes out at the end of the year is hard to tell. And I can't account for it because my 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 invested cost is 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 you know in stock inventory it's an asset so it's 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 hard to to take your assets and put them into a profitability uh um curve if you don't have a timeline that you can do that on and um so no i qu quick answer no i haven't even tried because i'm discouraged to try because i can see how difficult it would be to prove where where that cash flow separates from profitability uh so moving the date out and maybe in the meantime you could find you know vhcb has a crew of people uh that's supposed to help people with their applications and questions uh, about all this and uh you you know if we can move the date out so it gives those of you that haven't applied more time maybe working with some of the um, folks at VHCB uh, Farm Viability Program, they could help you maneuver through the maze of questions and, and we could get some money to you. For um, sure, that would be a possibility. And we have applied to VHCB for that. And we heard a brief response three weeks ago. And I think they're in the same boat as everybody else. So we're just overloaded with work and uh, both on the administrative and the executive level in terms of, you know, actually getting the work done. Yes, I appreciate your comment, Senator Starr. And I, I've, I have thought about that. Well, good. Um, well, to move on, we're, we're still running a little late. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Andrea at Rural Vermont. Are you with us, Andrea? Yes, and yes I, I am. Linda has a chart to put up. Yes, I, I wanted to, um, first of all, thank you everyone for making the time this morning. 
Um, I'm really glad that you're all able to be here. I think you're getting a really good uh, picture, how, however uh, concerning it is of the situation that's out there for this really important sector of our agricultural economy. Um, I'm gonna try and be brief. I do wanna draw your attention to something and I'm hoping that um, Linda is able to put this up for you. It is a, a flow chart that the Agency of Agriculture created for the uh, application process. And if you can scroll down, Linda, to so that we can see the bottom of the chart, you will see that um, up a little bit, up a little bit. Okay, so on the left there, you'll see, did your business have a net profit for the period of March 1st to August 1st? If you say no, uh, you're eligible, but if you say yes, you're not. And then if you uh, say yes, you are bumped over to what is essentially the working lands track, but you'll see in that first box that you have to have at least one W-2 employee in order to continue. And if you don't, and that would be true for all sole proprietor uh, operations of which there are many, um, then you are out of luck. So this yeah, is another okay. wrinkle. This is another wrinkle in the system that I think um, we have to deal with. Andrea, doesn't it say in brackets, this number may include the owner? It does, but if, if the owner is not a W-2 employee, if that's not how they're running their business, um, and I think Nico referenced you know, some of the issues for these farms, they operate on a different calendar system than, for example, the dairy farms. So I just wanted to make you guys aware of this other piece of the puzzle. Um, and I know even just looking at this flow chart, you get an idea of how um, uh, involved this application is, particularly all of the documentation that farmers have to pull together, put into electronic format and, and upload. Um, and I also know that it's true that BHCB is uh, getting heavily oversubscribed with people asking for help. Um, so I just want to reiterate, obviously moving the date out is really critical, but if we can find a creative solution to this profitability problem, um, I think that is a really critical piece because as Maddie mentioned, the pot of money that's available uh, over here on the left-hand side is considerably bigger than the pot of money that's available on the working land side. And we could serve a lot more people. Um, I just wanna make a couple more points. I'm aware of the fact that uh, time is tight. Um, I don't wanna take away any time from the farmers who you know, pulled themselves off the fields or out of wherever to uh, testify today. I do have a brief statement that was submitted by Taylor Mendel from Footprint Farm. Uh, she was not able to be here this morning because they're in the middle of harvest. Um, but here's what she had to say. They're located in Starksboro, their diversified vegetable farm. Um, yeah. Timing, due to the busy nature of the summer vegetable growing season, we leave much of our bookkeeping until the fall. In order to be ready for this application period, we hired an additional part-time person in order to have the time to get our books in order, only to find out once the application opened that we did not qualify. The application criteria feels like it penalizes farms that pivoted early in the COVID crisis. Nearly a third of our business, $37,000, usually comes from the Shelburne Farmers Market, which decided early on that they would not open this year. We also realized that another third of our business, wholesale greens to restaurants, would suffer this summer. Rather than lose that money entirely, which, of, which would have qualified us for this relief money, we invested in packaging, invested in an online store, hired more staff, doubled the size of our CSA program. We also worked with other farmers and producers who had lost that <coughs> in revenue to include their products in our CSA. Due to the nature of CSA, we then received our whole year's worth of income between March and July which inflated our gross earnings for those months. The guidelines for this relief fund did not take into account the quintupled costs we incurred to save our business. They do not take into account farms that have, have an uneven cash flow throughout the year, and they do not support farms that have done everything in their power to stay open, feed people, and continue to represent the strength and fortitude of Vermont's working farms. Sincerely, Taylor, Taylor Mendel, Footprint Farm, Starksboro, Vermont. 
So that's just another quick snapshot of uh, a very similar situation that's been experienced by many, many farms around the state. Um, and <laughs> I appreciate the conversation about the slaughterhouse issue. It's a huge one and, and it's definitely one that I hope we can continue to work on. Um, but because that is, uh, they had, ex they, they're going to have expenses if they have to hold their livestock over the, over the winter and they're going to lose the income this fall, as Nico said. Um, I think we have to get creative about solving this problem of the profitability. I know the agency has said that it's a very difficult lift technologically for the contracted company that put this application up to fix it. But uh, I just think there's got to be a workaround here <coughs> to get more people eligible for this money and not leave it on the table so that we can you know, shore up our food system. We don't know what the fall is going to bring. Um, we don't know what the virus is going to do. Um, so I really hope that these, these two committees, all of you, very smart people, really dedicated and appreciate all the work that you've done. Um, and, and we're ready to work with you and we can bring more examples or more specific ideas to you uh, whenever you're ready for them. Um, and I will stop now because Corey Pierce from uh, Bread and Butter Farm, who also serves on the Rural Vermont Board, is ready to also offer her testimony and then we could take questions after we both are done. Yeah, thank, thank you, Andrea uh, and Corey, are you with us? Corey? Yeah, you gotta unmute yourself. Okay, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Sorry, I'm not good at this. Um, <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, I, I think hearing uh, Taylor's, yeah, so I'm Corey Pierce, I bread and butter farm. We're on the town line of Shelburne in South Burlington. Um, we do 100% uh, grass fed cattle, pork, organic vegetables. We also do um, a lot of other related, but non, non directly agricultural enterprises, including uh, summer camp and some year round programming with kids. And, you, and we do work with UVM and the farmer training program, as well as on-farm events, including our summer burger nights. Um, I, I, I uh, definitely relate to Taylor's statement. Um, for sure, we pivoted quick and early with anticipation of losing a number of our markets, including, um, we, so we have a very, traditionally had a very small CSA and then have sold to restaurants and um, to uh, uh, some local markets, stores, wholesale accounts. Um, and we were just unclear of how that was gonna go. We are also getting a lot of interest. So we, we quadrupled our CSA, created an online platform, started doing online farm store sales. Um, and same thing, and brought in a lot more money than we normally do in a, in a short time frame, normally our cash flow, ha you know, has ups and has peaks and dips. But this made it where we had we peaked all of our, you know, vast majority of our income in like May and June, which is new for us. Um, and then also invested a lot of costs. So created this online platform, put in tons of safety protocol processes for both our staff, but then also how we interact with customers. Um, created partnerships with other farms that lost their accounts, like those going down to New York City and selling that suddenly couldn't, and restaurant, people with restaurants did a lot of that, um, collaborating with other farmers. We, we increased our refrigeration cooling capacity. So I would also echo what Nico said, it's really difficult right now to predict our profitability. I'm definitely, when I looked into the, into the application, I just, you know, don't know how to to do that right now. Um, so you know, it's is a bit overwhelming and hard to hard to uh, to figure that out in a short period of time. So I'm also, you know, slammed right now and trying to stay up on paperwork and stay up on all my accounting and bookkeeping. So it's 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 definitely an overwhelming time to try to like do a bunch of the. Uh, deep level accounting and business analysis that I usually do in the later part of the season. Um, and I will just also echo the slaughterhouse thing. We are definitely sitting on animals that we normally, like we could sell right now and we don't have the dates with slaughterhouses. Um, 
and that's that's a really long you know short long term scary one because dates are pretty pretty booked we we jumped on that actually right at the beginning of the pandemic and did get dates so i know there's people in worse situation than us but we booked dates through this year but next year's looking just as bad and challenging for especially for smaller scale like us so yeah, I so those are all kind of my like quick and dirty. Um, in addition to some markets that we completely lost, like we didn't we didn't do any burger nights this year, and that was tip. That's traditionally been about a third of our beef sales for the year, um, and we are able to get a higher price per pound when we do burger nights. So it's it's been a really helpful part of our paying down our our large amount of debt that being a first generation farm um, that we have, Bergenite has served as a great way to kind of help pay down debt service. So even though we've sold our beef in other ways, it's obviously been at a much, um, much lower price per pound. So I think those are, oh, I guess one last thing, you know, I mentioned that we do other, um, other enterprises here that aren't exactly agriculture, but like our summer camps, which are true farm camps and our on-farm events, which are obviously featuring our food, don't qualify. So, so that that is always something I always run into because I'm this mixed. So I'm in Shelburne. I have a um, I'm zoned as integrated agriculture, which has been a wonderful designation and wonderful to work with my my town on that. And they really uh, embraced and and been excited about that we do these mixed use things, but it provides some challenges around grants and things like this, because, you know, I ran my summer camp this year, which was amazing, but I ran it at, I, I cut it in half, but I kept the same, I actually had more costs to run it because I kept the same number of staff and we had a lot more costs for safety protocols. So it ran, it basically didn't make us any money. And nor, again, normally I count on the profit from that to help with some of our other debt. So, but that's summer camp. So that's not really qualifiable in all of this. So it's, it's just hard to understand how to, navigate a business that has mixed enterprises among true agriculture enterprises. <clears throat> Corey, did you check with uh, ACCD to see if they had any of their programs that they're offering uh, that would uh, help your, um, your summer camp program? Um, I, I, it's a similar kind of I have, I've seen it and I'm, I have similar questions. So I need to, again, it's like, it's cumbersome and I'm, and I'm looking into it, but we, but so I guess the short answer is I'm looking into it and I haven't gotten my full answer on it yet. Yeah. Uh, are there questions uh, for <laughs> Corey or Andrea from the committee? No? John, well, I see John's hand. Uh, John. Thank you, Bobby and Carolyn. While we have this assembly of very smart and knowledgeable people, uh, I just wanted to throw out a general question. Why both the ACCD and AAFM um, COVID applications run you through this W-2 requirement, which um, there's so many mom and pop businesses in Vermont that that, that then <clears throat> uh, makes them in, ineligible. And I just wondered, was that federal strings involved with this money or was it just a, a you know, an administration policy? It seems that, uh, I don't know. It, John, that, the, the smaller you are, the, the, you know, the more you're penalized. So John, that, I, I don't know what the answer is, but that was one of, that was going to be one of my points as we discuss uh, moving forward as sort of triggered by what Andrea said and, and my actual um, reaction when I was filling out the, uh, the grant application is why did they include the need for um, a W-2 employees? And is that the kind of thing that we could eliminate? It might, it might create some problems uh, for people who have already applied, but uh, that might be a simpler fix than uh, some others might be. So I think that's a question for the folks at the Agency of Agriculture and um, ACCD. Yeah. ACCD to figure out. <clears throat> well, it's only that you can be a sole proprietor 
uh, and apply for the ag money, the five million dollar ag money, um, as long as you didn't have a profit between March first and August first. But then, to, when you get bumped with the working lands money, all of a sudden you need to have a profit. Or no, no, no. Excuse me. You need to have an employee. And why? Why? You know why that? That's my question. Well, that's a, a question for, I think, us policy uh, makers to ask Anson <clears throat> and uh, Secretary Curley uh, and those folks, because, I mean, that had to have come from the administration. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, I'd, uh, love, I'd love to know the answer to that. Any, uh, Andrea? Um, I just wanted to add real quickly that, you know, we have heard testimony or you have heard testimony from the Agency of Agriculture that make, even though they seem to understand how problematic these provisions are, they have made it sound like it's, it's really going to be difficult and really impossible, largely because of the software developer that the state contracted with to do all these applications. But I just find it really hard to believe that we can't come up with some simple workaround um, to if, if it is the will of these committees and the legislature who created this program to make this work for the people who need this relief uh, in the time frame that we have, um, let's just get creative and figure out a way to do this. Um, it's disappointing that the agency did not consult uh, bef you know, when they were setting up this application with a lot of the folks who were going to have to be in impacted by it. Um, and I think that's part of the reason we ended up with some of the requirements that are so onerous um, and don't make sense for this sector of agriculture. So uh, we're really appreciative that this program exists. We have to find a way to get it to work for the people who need the help. Well, that's, uh, that's very true. And that's the only reason the program got set up is to help people. And here we are uh, hitting our heads against the wall. Uh, but um, you know, <clears throat> there isn't anything that's impossible to do. And so, uh, Bobby, uh, um, earlier earlier in the meeting, Terry Norris put a a, a chat a, a little notice in the chat, which said that when we heard from Diane Bothfeld, I can't remember. It must have been yesterday or the day before. Who knows? Um, th that um, that potentially it could take. Um, several weeks to actually implement changes and uh, to this program. And so that might be problematic in trying to get the money out in a timely way. I don't, I'm not saying that that should stop us, but it's just something that um, is uh, of concern. Uh, but the other thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to say that, you know, the agency tried very hard to get this money out quickly. And this was not an easy lift. So um, I agree with Andrea, it would have been nice to have been consulted about some of this stuff, but um, they, they made their best effort. So um, I think it's pretty amazing that they got done what they got done because they did the dairy first. But anyway, you're right. We want to get this out to folks who need it. And, and then that's another question. Um, do we want this money to go to people who ultimately do make a profit? Um, or do we want it to go to people who really have experienced serious losses and expenses? Well, that's uh, that's our jobs to figure this out. And, um, um, you know, we put this together sort of in a hurry as well. So, yeah, and we I mean, we share some of the the blame, that's for sure. Um, but anyways, uh, we'll move on to the Intervail Center. And uh, Sam, are you with us? Um, hey, Bobby, I think Chris wanted to say something. Senator yeah. Pearson. Chris? Uh, I, I just, I, I think to Representative Partridge's question, the answer is already answered in the way we handle dairy, the way we handle processors, the way we handle every small business that gets assistance through ACCD. Nobody but diversified farmers has this net profitability requirement. And, and I think the legislature, the onus should be on us to explain why this class of business 
should be treated differently. And I, I can't for the life of me think of a single reason why. So, so I'm going to push this back at you guys. Why did you put that in there? We did not. Carolyn, we, we put that in there because we were trying to get um, funding for non-dairy farmers and your committee was not supportive of that. And this was the compromise that we came up with. We wanted farms that were not dairy farms to be able to apply for and get funding to offset their losses and their expenses due to COVID. And this but why that compromise. provision, Ruth? Why that provision? That was the it compromise that we agreed to right. so that yeah. you would support this because you wanted right. to put all of the money into dairy, Carolyn. No, no, you know what, Ruth? That's not exactly true. Um, I'm well, delighted that we got non-dairy money, but part of this, and and uh, and we didn't say anything. We want we want folks who are not going to make a profit overall, but not between those specific dates. We never well, said that. Can, we can <laughs> we can debate who did what and when, but our our minds and our hearts were all in the right place. And this issue uh, has come up to, you know, to be a problem and we just got to fix it. So rather than spending our time chewing um, on who did what, when, we ought to spend it on fixing the issue, which uh, we'll, we'll do. And by the way, Bobby, the uh, Vegetable and Berry Growers Association are not going to be available today. So, um, so uh, just so you know, we've made up a little bit of time there. Oh, well, I guess we're so Sam, Sam, is Sam with us? I am. Yep. Uh, so we'll move on to the intervale uh, in their issues. Uh, Sam, welcome. Hi, uh, thank you for having me here. My name is Sam Smith. I work for the Intervale Center. I am a farm business planner and I'm primarily funded through the Vermont Farm and Forest Viability Program. I have testified before this group plenty of times before. Um, and, you know, I'd like to echo what Andrea said there first and foremost in that, um, you know, What's done is done. What we need to do is address the situation and try to move forward. And really, um, you know, I I was involved in a number of conversations um, with the agency of ag uh, around crafting the application for this program, and we brought up this issue a number of times during those conversations. And their response was always that it was the way this legislation was written, and that's why it was gonna end up being the way it was. And I think, you know, the impetus is on this group to make the recommendation that that language needs to be changed and it needs to be addressed as quickly as possible. Um, because, and, you know, I'm not gonna go through all the different nuances that the, these producers and other groups have put forward here, but the majority of them are spot on. I think the ones that, the points that I would like to make here, I've assisted on a, numerous dairy applications and a number of the federal program applications. Those were, you know, the majority of my life for a couple of months, right? When we went into lockdown um, and now we're on to this funding. And I think that, um, you know, the key concern is that this funding is not accessible to the majority of diversified farmers. I have yet to work with a producer that is going to be eligible for that $5 million pot. They just cannot meet those requirements around no net profit. Um, and the reason that is, is that net profit is calculated based on the business activity that's going on. It does not take into account the below the line activity that the majority of farms have, which is that they take that net profit and then they apply it to other expenses such as debt, depreciation, and the income of the farmer. So a lot of times that net profit is the income that they take home. So I think a lot of our farms, we've talked about seasonality and we have talked about the difficulty of uh, bookkeeping and applying that bookkeeping to the calculations that the agency is requesting. But the reality is that net profit is sort of, it's not a realistic number because the majority of our farms operate in a pretty leveraged manner, um, and especially dairies. Like if, if this stipulation had been made for dairy farms, 
none of those farms would have been able to apply for this funding. So I think once again, it behooves you to go back and, and change the language. The agency will deal with it. They have been, and I have to say, they have been absolutely wonderful. Like the agency people have struggled really hard to make this application process as equitable as pro possible and bring service providers into the loop to help with the application. Um, so I think that, you know, but it really is up to them to implement it. It's up to you to change the language. Um, I would make some suggestions around that. I think that, you know, it's not impossible. The dairy, the dairy applications have the same issues around each farm has their own nuances in the way they, they calculate their mm -hmm. profit and the way that they do their bookkeeping. Um, and the agency has been flexible in that in the dairy application. And I think they could be flexible in that in this application. Basically, you have to demonstrate what your losses were. And they use generally use 2019 numbers, which does hurt newer producers who just started up or were going through an expansion, uh, or if there's a seasonal variability. But it does give you a starting point to say, I, I made this much in 2019 and I made this much in 2020 because of COVID. And then you can also demonstrate the direct expenses or increase in expenses related to COVID, which is, you know, farmers should be able to do that. So it's not impossible. Um, it is challenging, but it, it really is important. Um, the other things that I just want to emphasize, having worked with producers really intensively during this whole time, is that, you know, these producers, the majority of our diversified producers experienced a very different thing than our dairy producers in that their demand jumped exponentially right as we were all going into this sort of period of real great uncertainty. And they really had a, a increased level of risk uh, associated to their staff and families. Um, and they worked really hard to pivot and serve their communities and provide fresh local food. And it also presented an opportunity for us to grow this food system we've been working on for the past 10 years, 15 years here, really intensively, but like through farm to plate, we were able to implement things really, really quick, quickly. And I think the working lands money is a great sort of indicator of that. Um, so a number of these farms pivoted so quickly and they had the opportunity to do that where our dairy farmers didn't. But I think what we need to do is if we change this language, it allows us to acknowledge the importance of these businesses to the future of our Vermont communities, right? These farms are the farms that are going to replace the declining dairy farm population. They're gonna, they're gonna utilize that land and they're going to provide the economic activity and the food and the community that we need to maintain our rural character in Vermont. So I would just urge you to go back and change the language or amend the language. And the agency is responsible for implementing that, but the, these, these businesses need this money to stay in business. I would echo what Jen said right back at the beginning. You know, I saw farms that had a huge spike in sales in, the, in March, April, May, and then their, their sales have totally tailed off as retail stores open back up. And I think the majority of the farms that I work with are probably gonna end up right about in the same spot they were that we had projected they would be at by the end of the year. But there are some that are just not, you know, not in a good position based on their markets. So I'm gonna yield the floor here to Amanda, who I can think, I think can really speak personally to that, um, that experience and what is going on in our farm community right now. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Sam. Um, uh, before we jump to Amanda, did uh, or have you have you talked with the agency in regards to the difficulty of the applicants that you've been helping uh, to meet that criteria? So we we had extensive, uh, really extensive conversations with the agency around this net profitability language before they even crafted the application. So I have, honestly, I have not done, um, I've had two, I've had two farms apply for this money um, because the rest of them look at the application and say, it's not worth my time. 
um, and they know that they're not eligible for that pool um, and there is not a lot of clarity around how to demonstrate the losses or increased expenses. Um, I'm happy to help people with that. Like that's why we're here. The Farm Viability Network is, we, yeah. we do have capacity and we're really, um, we're open to working with people on that. And we did a lot of those for the dairy applications. But with that, with that language inserted there, the majority of our producers are not, they're either not eligible or, or they're, they're eligible for a very small amount of money. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, we'll talk with um, Gus and the crew at VHCB to see if they can come on board and help us with this issue because um, it really needs to be fixed. Yeah. Um, so Amanda, uh, if there are any questions, uh, speak up, but we'll move on to Amanda. Hi, um, my name is Amanda Andrews. I own and operate Tamarack Hollow Farm. Uh, we, raise, we raise 10 acres of certified organic vegetables, um, laying hens on pasture. And for 10 years, we have done 200 Thanksgiving turkeys on pasture, which we are not doing this year because of the fear around COVID returning in the fall and Thanksgiving not being a thing. Um, I started my farm in 2010. Uh, I sell exclusively to the New York City Farmers Market. I attended the Union Square Green Market on Wednesdays year round and on Saturdays during peak season. It's a farmers market where 60,000 people walked past my stand and I was proud to represent Vermont agriculture to that market. We sold to some of the best restaurants in the country. And in March 15th, all of those restaurants were ordered closed. I immediately lost a third of my business Within a day of that, it became clear that we could no longer responsibly travel to that market for the health of my employees and my family and the state as a whole to not travel across state lines and 100% of my business was gone. My business has been through a lot. We survived Tropical Storm Irene. I, with the help of Farm Viability, moved my farm to higher land, purchased a farm, an old dairy farm that was not being used relocated, thereafter went through a divorce with my then partner, bought him out of the business. During all of that time, I was showing increased sales, growing a very strong business, was in a great position, was able to hire more employees year after year, reinvest in my business and take a small salary. With this collapse in the market and inability to access the market I've grown over 10 years. I pivoted quickly as a lot of the other producers have talked about. I had a truckload of produce ready to go when the restaurant shut down. I cold called every wholesaler I knew and was able to sell all of that produce at a half to a third of the price, even though my costs of creating that product had not changed and had in fact increased. Yeah. We needed the wholesale markets I was able to pick up in the next few weeks throughout March and early April replaced one of my weekly farmers markets, but that was not gonna be enough to continue operating. So I began a direct market sales through a CSA program like a lot of the producers have talked about. And that was very successful through March and April. In May, we almost hit our 2019 sales numbers. As soon as it started to warm up, and people felt more comfortable going to grocery stores, that program collapsed from sales of 75 members to around 30. Um, the, loss, the losses we're looking at from March 1st through the end of July are about $15,000. August alone is another $15,000 we're looking at more losses going into the fall. I echo what the other producers said about the difficulty of ascertaining profitability and monthly expenses at this time of year when we're all extremely busy. I am in a position that I do know my numbers. I have been able to create all the reports the application requires. And I do know that according to the rules of this application, 
I show a net profit during that period. That profit is not enough to cover the debt service that Sam is talking about. My mortgage, my delivery truck payment have been graciously deferred during this period. I would already be out of business if they hadn't. The profit I've made during this period is not enough to cover those payments when they come due. I've already shrunk my business to meet what market is available to me. In 2019, I had 14 W-2 employees. This year, I only have eight. I would love to regain the sales I've lost, but I'm focusing on developing a strong, stable business here. And with this aid, I will be able to pay off some of that debt so that I can maintain my business at this new level. This is the same way that dairy farms operate. As Sam spoke to, they did not have this net profit requirement on their aid money. My debt service is not to cover luxuries. It's to cover a tractor, a delivery vehicle, my mortgage, my pickup truck that I use for poultry chores. Without aid, I will not be able to service this debt and I will go bankrupt while I'm showing a profit. That's just for this period. As a lot of the dairy, um, as a lot of the meat producers said, fall is an extremely expensive time. Our labor needs increase going into fall. Our feed costs for our poultry. Our winter housing costs, getting winter housing up and secure, securing our tunnels and our fall and winter vegetable crops that, we'll, that our neighbors will depend on if grocery stores once again become an unsafe place. All of those costs are being incurred now. And I do not know if they will yield a profit next year or not. I know that you all have put a lot of work into this and I really hope that you're able to examine the net profitability language and the time frame in which that net profitability period is currently put into place. Um, the idea of net profitability on a diversified farm or a dairy farm on any farm is really a false notion. Um, none of us are rolling in the dough where, as Sam said, that is what we use to service our debt and maybe take home a paycheck at the end of the year. So without, without what is being termed net profitability, I can't operate my business. Um, <coughs> I, well, are you go ahead. finished? <laughs> go ahead, Amanda. No, I was just gonna say, I, I appreciate the work you put into it. I really hope that we're able to find a fix for this. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what that fix is. It, it, it's painful to hear that um, the reason it can't be fixed is because of a contract with a software company or a computer programmer, um, that that's gonna risk putting our farms that are keeping our working landscape functioning out of business. Uh, it does not seem like a fair trade-off. Yeah, well, we, we certainly have our work cut out for us uh, to fix this. Um, See, part of the applications are already in. Uh, people have got their, their applications uh, half filled out. And so we'd have to, I don't know, forgive that section. But then when you go on your computer and push the button, I don't know, we, we need to really spend some serious time with a computer programmer to see um, you know if this can be done without having to change everybody's application whether it could be changed right in-house um, so anyways are there questions uh, 
Somebody had their hand up, Charlene. Thank you. Um, I I cannot um, actually do more than than video and communicate and listen right now because my internet's so poor. But I guess I I tried looking at the Agency of Ag website to see if there was an option for people to print off the form and fill it out by hand. There's not. Okay, so we're we are really stuck. Okay. Uh, so I would like to say that the dairy application has an option to come in and amend it. Uh, so dairy, the dairy application actually allows for a second, essentially what is a second application for additional costs later in the year. So once again, I, you know, I commend the agency for the work that they've done, but, you know, I think it, what, what your responsibility is, is to really to address the legislation. Their responsibility is to figure out how to uh, implement it. But I don't, you know, I don't think it's impossible. I think what we have here is it's a lot of work, but everything at this point is a lot of work. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's like if they are, it, if you want to make this $5 million accessible to the farmers who rightfully should have access to it, you need to change the language to make that happen. Well, Bobby, <clears throat> Bobby. Yes. Um, so I would ask um, Sam for uh, any suggestions he might have. I do know that having filled this out myself, that the almost the uh, second to the last step, uh, there's a, a page about economic harm. Yep. So for instance, my New York Sheep and Wool Festival, which is a major portion of my income, uh, is in October, which is technically past the, um, the date of August 1st. Uh, and, but, uh, and actually it might go till September 30th, but at any rate, um, you have an opportunity to include economic harm. And I'm wondering if Amanda could include, if she did apply, if she could include uh, all of those payments that she has to make in that economic harm uh, section. And I don't know, Sam, you're- that's, Yeah, so that's the way that they have addressed the sort of variability in the dairy applications is that economic harm section. And once again, it goes back to some of the challenges around the software and the capacity to upload documents that can be challenging, but that's where they have um, allowed farms to really advocate for what they see as an additional expense or uh, an additional level of loss. So like a great example of that would be, um, you know, say a farm that had to pivot over to direct market sales. Like I, I worked with a dairy that um, their, primary, uh, their primary market which was a cheese maker evaporated and they had some raw milk sales and they pivoted and, and built a farm stand and they were able to advocate that the renovations to the farm stand and the addition of a point of sale system so that they could have customers interact in a cashless environment was an additional expense related to COVID. And that's gonna allow that farm to stay in business. And I think, you know, the calculations around net profit and thinking about later in the year, I think being able to demonstrate the loss, like in terms of Amanda's case, she has really good numbers. I've worked with her. She's a phenomenal producer and a phenomenal businesswoman, right? She is a, what I would consider to be a top tier farmer in this state. And she has, the, she has the records to look back and look what her sales are. I know that that Thanksgiving market was probably maybe even like 20% of your sales for the year. It's a huge, huge market, right? And so she has the capacity to look at what that potential level of sales was and then what she could project out for sales based on her product availability. If she's not going to that market, she doesn't have that $40,000 in income that they would have generated in that day. So, right. And that could have been potentially something that she listed as <clears throat> economic harm. Yeah for the month of November. Yep. Yeah. I do wanna say the way the application is structured, um, you it's asking for receipts to document costs and stuff. And it's really hard to know 
my fear with, I have not, I've have my application done. I have not submitted it yet out of fear that it's going to be flagged uh, for questions and the pool of money that I'm eligible for is going to disappear before I can answer those questions because I am shunted into this smaller pool of money. Um, the documentation of how do you prove a negative? How do I demonstrate that the profitability that my QuickBooks profit and loss statement shows is not really there. That's the money I'm going to use to pay my debt service that I know I would have made X amount of money at the Thanksgiving market, but I'm not going. Um, documenting those sorts of losses when I know I have a limited amount of time and the pool of money is shrinking every day is, is stressful because this aid is what is going to keep my business going. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. <clears throat> yeah, the um, non-dairy, um, you know, there's a ton of money left in that kitty. And yeah. we, it's very important that we figure out how to uh, how to get this done so you folks can pick that up and and use it to stay in business. Uh, so you know that's our full intentions of fixing this so that you can qualify and and uh, get what rightfully what we planned is rightfully yours uh, for your losses. Um, any other questions, Anthony? Yeah, two things. One is clearly we've got to fix this problem. I mean, we helped create it. We need to fix it. These folks are making it really clear what the problem is. I wonder whether this is a possibility of the uh, Working Lands Program is a Vermont program, not a federal program. Is there a way that we can change the criteria of the Working Lands Program to remove that, that um, issue around the W-2? How many W-2 employees do you have? And move, change the criteria in the Working Lands Program to allow more people to qualify we would also have to move, make sure the CARES money is moved over into that program because there's obviously more money available to move, yeah. to move the 5 million over to the Working Lands Program. But I guess what I'm saying is instead of trying to change the working, change the program that we've screwed up, move all that money into Working Lands and then change the criteria for the Working Lands Program so that we make it easier for people to qualify for that money. So it's just a thought. I mean, we'd have to think it through more, but I just wonder if there's a possibility of doing that. <clears throat> well, that, uh, that was, my intention uh, to, is to try to change that. Uh, and it's, it, you know, that's a Vermont, like you said, a Vermont law, and we should be able to amend that bill um, without too many problems. Um, Especially since we've, we've changed a lot of things as part of the emergency response to COVID-19. So we could even say that we're changing it for during. this particular time frame or whatever, but until yep. this problem so, goes away. So Bobby, I think that the money that's in that that portion of the working lands, and and Michael Grady's on the call, so he can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that is COVID money that we're talking about. So there are there are um, certain requirements, but you know as to when it needs to be spent. But um, I'm not sure why the requirement is there for a W-2 employee. Mike, do you know the answer to that? I uh, just checked uh, the act that appropriated that money. I could not find the W-2 requirement. I've reached out to the drafter of it to see if he can provide some information on that. I, I will let you know as soon as I find out. Uh, but you are correct that the money that's a large part of the money, not all of it, that's in working lands right now is, is CRF money, CARES Act money. Yeah. So would it be possible for us to move more of that money into that fund? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And and there's no there's no requirement in the federal money uh, that you have to be non profitable or profitable or have W twos uh, because we didn't put any of that in the farm language, the dairy farm language, and and that's rolling along pretty decent. So I'm glad you're with us, Michael. I didn't realize you were on. So <clears throat> you heard the discussion. And um, Michael, for those of you that aren't familiar, Michael O'Grady's our 
legal um, person for the ag committees along with some other committees and and uh, does an excellent job uh, working doing our work for us um, so anyways uh, Bobby I hope that we get this figured out for you along with the rest of the people that have testified so far uh, we Bobby we still have some more Yes, uh, Carolyn. Yeah, the only thing I want to say is that I think that the um, the the part of the tension here is the the timeline of it all and making sure that um, people who really need the money get the money, but that it has to be expended. And this is a question for Michael Grady too. Um, by I think it's December twentieth. I could be wrong about that, but so it has to be out there and it's technically supposed to be i believe spent is that correct mike well, no that's not uh, i mean even from me that's not correct in the farm language stuff it has to be expended from the agency to the farmer but the farmer does not have to have it expended okay so so you're right. both a little you're both a little right um <laughs> so the, the the federal requirement is reversion of on uh, un, any unexpended funds on December 30th to avoid that and to allow for use um, the authorized uses under the CARES Act on December 20th state law provides that any unexpended money is going to go into the UI fund which is an authorized use, the unemployment insurance fund, which is an authorized use under the CARES Act. Um, for the issue of expenditure, all of the ag programs is, um, the applicants need to show economic harm. They have to already show expenses. So what, what they are being awarded is their expenses. And so effectively a grant from the agency meets the expenditure requirement under the CARES Act. Okay. If they were looking for future cost, future expenses, then the recipient would have to spend that by the December 30th deadline. So future expenses need to be spent by the recipient. Economic harm, prior expenses, they are effectively just reimbursing the applicant. So are we all set on that issue? Um, so are there any other questions for um, or Sam? If not, uh, we'll move on. Um, I understand the vegetable and berry people are not with us, so we'll um, move on. Nico yeah. has his hands up there, Senator Starr. <laughs> who do you who, see him? Uh, Nico Horster there, he's raising his hand. Oh, yeah. No, I, didn't, I didn't see that, but. Um, I, if I could yeah. ask a clarifying question about that. So if we're looking at expenses that uh, this is, uh, directed to, to Michael, uh, uh, which was very helpful to hear that. So in our world, you know, as you probably heard, and I don't know how long you've been on the call, I've been tracking all the participants. Um, a lot of our expenditures are, you know, seasonal. So can we pre-expend, uh, uh, you know, if I'm paying my hay bills now out of my line of credit, can I pay my line of credit, which I wouldn't usually pay back till the spring when I have the money again, can I pay that as an expenditure with the grant? So to start pre-expending it and therefore show a loss, because if I did that and I paid my hay bills right now, I would have a loss on my books and then I would get the grant and then I would actually issue the check to my hay supplier uh, for my winter feeding bill, which is gonna put me into the negative numbers again, right? So this is what we're talking about, but this is not a common accounting practice. This, I would consider this somewhat questionable. And so the, 
really, but this is what we're talking about. This is what I'm hearing from Amanda. This is what, I, what we hear, heard from Corey. And, and you know, all of us are similar in that our expenses fluctuate wildly. We have debt service that is relatively constant, but for some of us, the debt service accumulates with the large bills at certain times of the year. Thank you. Uh, 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 address that a little bit just in the conversations with the agency of ag i think the way they've approached this in the dairy applications is that they have you have to be able to justify the expense so that is obviously prepaying expenses is a commonplace way of you know potentially dodging a tax bill but it's not necessarily uh going to get you more funding in this case so i think it doesn't you know, if, if you were to sort of game the system to not show a net, net profit through paying your hay bill, you may be able to do that in this case. But I think overall, the agency is looking through the details of each of these applications and they will come back with questions if there's a, a questionable expense like that. And then they would probably ask for documentation from 2019, which is what they've done for the dairy farms around that type of thing. Uh, <clears throat> Michael, um, this is Bobby. Uh, do you have any um, um, answers to the questions that uh, Nikhail um, asked? Uh, I think, um, you know, technically on the just a plain reading of, of the language in the bill and the federal guidance, you might be able to do that pre-order, but I think Sam is correct that the agency is going to look and see that you're not trying to manipulate your expenses um, and is trying to do due diligence to make, to ensure that, that they're good faith expenses. So, um, oh, yeah, totally. I, I completely hear you there. I mean, I have the hay, the hay comes off the field directly to us. I don't right. pay my hay bill till February, March, April, or whenever. So mm -hmm. I, there's a built-in line of credit right. by the hay suppliers, which is inofficial. But in theory, they could invoice me right now. Yeah. I could pay it right now, well, and I'd be, uh, you know, I'd be in. I, I, I think we're shape you, financially, correct? You, you could, you could make yeah. a good faith assertion that that is a, a current yeah. expense, and the billing has just changed from previous years. Yeah, that, that that type of kind of fact base on the ground expense is something that that the agency is going to review and and uh, before you start, you know, you know, gathering more expenses, you probably should check with the agency on, on what they're going to to review as as good faith. Um, if they're no, thank you, Michael. If there are uh, no other questions, uh, we'll move on to the Vermont Maple uh, Sugar Makers. And Allison Hooper, are you on? I am. It's Hope as a as a last name, which is um, good to have uh, right now. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for having us. And I'll I'll keep it brief because I think that everyone has really clearly made. The point, and I'm glad. I think it was probably Andrea who first brought it up. I'm glad she brought up the W two issue. It really is a double whammy for most folks. So the Vermont Maple Sugar Makers Association, as one of the oldest ag associations in the United States, um, we've been around since 1893. Right now, we represent about a thousand producers. Many of them are smaller producers who have less than 4,000 taps. So really small family producers, um, just like most of the people on this call, trying to make a living on Vermont's working landscape. Um, between the net profit benchmark between March and August and um, having W-2 employees, uh, those, those are barriers to entry for most, the majority of maple producers who are smaller. So, Again, like everyone else, we're seasonal and March to August, that time frame doesn't represent that seasonality. So the maple season, as you probably know, uh, runs from mid to late February and into April, depending of course on where your sugar bush is uh, located in the state. So this year producers were able to tap trees and collect and boil down sap into syrup, but their income from the 2020 crop has either been uprooted, severely delayed, or has been a lot less profitable than usual, depending on how they had to pivot 
based on their own family and business needs and what sort of income they needed right after the season. So um, our smaller producers often have have done what they felt like they needed to do to diversify their income base, as you've heard from um, meat and vegetable producers. So they've incorporated agritourism, in-person local sales, retail, wholesale, restaurants, fairs and festivals, schools, colleges, and online. And um, those who thought they'd diversified enough for good business planning, um, you know, that sort of went out the window this year. Um, so, and then our Maple Open House Weekend in March was one of the first statewide events that was canceled because of the pandemic. Um, you know, we weren't going to see people coming into the state. We clearly didn't want people coming into the state. Uh, and small family sugar houses didn't necessarily want crowds in their sugar houses. Um, and that, for folks, is a great way to create new marketing and new relationships um, around the region and not just in Vermont. Um, so they couldn't sell there. The other issue that Maple has run into is that we need to package our product in order to sell it. And the pandemic has caused an issue, um, a lot of unexpected issues for everybody, but an unexpected issue in the sense that we've had a harder time getting um, association containers from our uh, producer who creates the container, lines it with a coating, um, and then gives us the plastic caps to go with it. Um, when I try to get plastic caps for our sample jars, at this point, those plastic caps have a 20 week turnaround time. So our jugs have had a month's turnaround time. So people who ordered their jugs on time last January, many of them are just receiving those jugs right now to be able to sell syrup. So having a product and putting the expense into getting a product, um, is one thing, but at this point, if you don't have the jugs to sell your maple syrup, um, you may be able to get in with a bulk buyer if you haven't already had that relationship. Um, if you pivot it in that way, it means that you're earning far less um, per pound of maple syrup than you would otherwise. Um, maple producers are at the point this fall where they're gonna be getting ready for next season. So their expenses for tapping and tubing and labor in the sugar bush, their equipment upgrades, um, and trying to order more containers um, to package their product, those expenses are coming without the associated income um, that's gonna help them get ready for the next season. So not fixing this language to give them access to funding that they need between the no net profit and the W-2 employees means that we're creating this ripple effect where they're not gonna be ready to have the money to get ready for the next season. Um, and that's just gonna cause problems down the line. Our maple producers that are smaller don't have W-2 employees. They're using family, they're using friends, um, or they're doing it themselves. And so if they showed a net profit because they were able to pivot some of their crop this year into cash, they're not going to fall into the other bucket. They're not going to qualify because they don't have those W-2 employees. Um, I also have uh, Emma Marvin from Butternut Mountain Farm, who's the chair of our board. Um, her family also produces syrup um, and they operate a retail um, establishment. So she's here to share some other perspective. Hi, folks. Thanks for taking time to listen to um, each of the stories from producers and from the associations that represent um, producers across Vermont's diversified agricultural economy. Uh, I'll just add a couple of points to build on what Allison has already um, shared. I, I want to set the scene a little bit by reminding everybody that as the first crop for the state of Vermont, um, maple producers were producing um, our crop at the peak of uncertainty um, as COVID was really ramping up. Um, and so what we experienced with the producers that we work with here at Butternut Mountain Farm um, was a tremendous amount of concern on their part about whether the market that they are typically used to selling into would even exist. Um, all of the producers with whom we work um, and all of the producers that I'm aware of as members of VMSMA, you know, I think took solace in going into the woods and um, having a harvest, um, but there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty during that process. 
Um, and as Allison alluded to, a number of the VMSMA members um, and sugar makers across the state lost an opportunity to directly market their products um, by having visitors come into the sugar house. Um, what we've seen as time has progressed in our own business is a 75% reduction in sales going into the food service sector, um, a 40 plus percent uh, reduction in sales going into the specialty sector, uh, and I highlight those two because those are two of the markets where producers have the easiest access um, to sell um, directly into those markets rather than working through a processor like Butternut Mountain Farm. Um, in the case of my business, um, we are very diversified. So the retail um, where we wholesale into retailers, grocery stores, club channel, mass market, that those customers have done phenomenally well um, and our business has grown because of the demand we're seeing through those channels. But that is the only place that our business has seen growth and everywhere else um, there's been a dramatic reduction and certainly those markets are challenging for individual producers to have access to. That's one of the values that Butternut Mountain Farm um, brings in the supply chain is access to those markets that are too difficult for us as individuals um, to gain access to. Um, the other thing I would just highlight is that um, maple, and this speaks a little bit to what Amanda highlighted around um, the uncertainty of the future. Um, maple is a cold weather food. So while we produce our crop in the spring, the reality is that much of the sales we experience um, are relatively um, static in the summer. We have farmers markets and that is a very important outlet for a number of producers, but the reality is many of our Vermont maple producers right now um, are trying to decide how they're going to uh, put their product out to market. Um, are they going to sell to a processor like Butternut Mountain Farm because of the uncertainty um, in their more traditional markets in the fall? Um, craft shows, um, specialty markets, um, direct to consumer, all of that uncertainty uh, provides a tremendous amount of challenge um, for those individuals. And many, um, we're getting regular phone calls now at Butternut Mountain Farm um, from producers who typically either withhold a portion of their crop um, for sales in the third and fourth quarter um, or have all of their crop move um, through ancillary channels, direct to consumer, um, direct to food service, direct to specialty retailer. Um, and those folks are looking for markets for their serpent. To Allison's point, you know, there is a dramatic difference in the cost, um, the, the value that those producers are going to um, receive for the products that they sell when they choose to sell in bulk versus um, to those other channels directly. Um, so, it, it's a really challenging time and I'm grateful that you all have put time and energy into trying to develop a program um, that addresses the risks that agricultural producers are having. Um, I think Representative Partridge earlier in the conversation, you highlighted it's complicated. Um, I think we all recognize that we have a diversity of businesses, a diversity of business models, and that um, uncertainty makes how all of those models work even more challenging. Um, and so I can appreciate the challenge you all face in trying to um, put together the boundaries of a program that is fair and equitable across a wide variety of um, needs. And with that, I think I will stop and open it up for questions for Allison and I. Bobby, you're muted. Bobby. Yeah, didn't I sound good? Yeah, you were really, you were at your best right then. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Brian, uh, you, you had a question, Senator Colmore? No, actually, Senator, I was just telling you you were muted. Sorry. <laughs> when I do this, it means I can't hear you. Oh. Um, well, I'll, I'll pay more attention to your hand signals. Um, I'm wondering um, in regards to uh, maple, I understand that this year was an exceptionally good year for sugar makers as far as production. Is, is that accurate or 
not? I think for most it was average to good. It really depends on where your sugar bush is and what your what your the sugar content of your sap was. So some areas of Vermont experienced low sugar content. Um, and so the higher sap yield meant that you made about the same, you're able to make about the same amount of syrup as in prior years. So it um, it varies based on location, but it was a it was a good crop this past year. <clears throat> yeah, well that uh, that's helpful if you can sell it. Bobby. Um, in a Bobby. year when you could, you're correct. <laughs> Bobby, I'll, I'll speak up for Rodney, who could not be on this call. Rodney Graham from Williamstown, our vice chair, he uh, reached his his goal of over two thousand, more than two thousand gallons. Uh, but he sells a lot of his syrup to the Capitol Plaza, which closed. And so, while he he had this great uh, goal and me, met it, um, his market was significantly. Uh, diminished. However, I will give a plug for his his maple. It's his, actually his nephew. His maple filled donuts um, are to die for. And if you happen to be able to find a store that sells them, it's Graham Family Farms um, maple cream filled donuts. Really oh. good. They have centered a lot of their new online uh, marketing and Facebook and Instagram posts to their donuts in the Montpelier area at local stores. Yeah. Yeah, they're <laughs> wonderful. The one thing I would add to answer that question, if I may, is just around the bulk markets. And so folks that were selling into the bulk market did see a significant decline in um, what they were being paid for their SERP between 2019 and 2020, largely driven by the Canadian exchange rate. Um, and well, folks can make arguments about whether that was COVID related or not, certainly the currency of fluctuations were um, dramatically impacted by the uncertainty of um, what COVID brought to, to the environment. Yeah. Uh, other questions for um, Allison or, or Emma? If, thank you both very much for your time and your testimony. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll move on to uh, Vermont Farm Bureau. Uh, Joe, are you with us? Yes, you're right on the screen. So, good morning. Welcome, Joe. Yeah, I don't want to, I mean, I'm always not unmuting myself, so I appreciate the fact. Uh, first of all, um, this is Joe Tisbert um, from Valley Green Farm and from Farm Bureau. Um, thank you for what you guys are doing here. This is uh, uh, it's my pleasure to be on today. I feel like I haven't seen you guys forever. Um, yeah. And I look forward, I always look forward to working with everyone here. Um, so our, our goal today was really, um, we thought that uh, this, this uh, discussion was going to be set around diverting dairy funds from dairy uh, to other types of agriculture, which clearly this is not the discussion for today. Um, which is which is fine with me because I wear a lot of those hats and and it, and it's so important that we have uh, the ability to not only service but to help every farm of every size of every of of every type um, and so clearly a lot of the things that we would have discussed have been brought up uh, the W two situation the timeline. You know, the application, I just finished the application for my own business. Um, we've had a devastating summer because we do a lot with agritourism and, and our agritourism uh, is non-existent. Um, I think we've, I think we were able to serve 20 people all, all summer, which is, you know, we would normally serve thousands of people um, during the summer months here. Um, so, you know, we, we have this clear, it's about a third of our businesses has gone away. So we, we are happy that we were able to uh, put an application in um, and try to and apply for some funds to see if this will help us out. But on um, the same token, um, you know, overall, some of our business uh, was a little stronger, uh, especially plant sales and, and early season uh, was the strongest we've ever had. Um, 
I've been on the phone with farms that are uh, doing maple. Um, one of the farms in particular, and I don't mean to step on maple's toes, but uh, one of the farms in particular has, does festivals and farmsdales. They have completely lost um, at least 50% of their business going down. And I, I've told them to jump on and try to apply for this uh, uh, funds to see if it'll work for them. But it's a very important that we look at all the aspects of these businesses that are that are doing it, along with um, dairy and and what's happening with dairy. I mean, you know, we can't forget anybody here. This is this is uh, this would be horrible to do. Um, one of the things that I think we should bring up, and I think it's been stated quite a ways around, is you know we, I think the governor's budget is cutting. Uh, not cutting, but putting five five hundred fifty thousand dollars into working lands. This processing issue is not going to go away without serious state funding. Um, we need an entrepreneur that will that's a, or entrepreneurial type people that are going to say, I, "I'm interested in this and I want to do it." But you know, it's clear that we don't have enough processing in this state. It's clear that a lot of the a lot of the uh, livestock farmers around us that um, sell meat directly uh, have really had a boom in, in in a short time frame, but overall, I'm not they're not able to get animals um, harvested. So, you know, there's a lot of things here that that you guys have hit today. Um, I I think uh, there's a lot of good points being made about the size farm. You know, if we don't support all the small farms, then we're not going to have a couple of small farms in the state. We, you know, we, we need to make sure that the funds are directed in the right ways. Um, so I would suggest that you think about, and, I, and when you get to your budget discussions, that you think about the working lands. And if this is something that, you know, we need as a state to do, I think there should be some kind of, um, strategic plan that says, okay, we want to earmark some of this money for that. And we should give a little more money to the working lands because it is so critical to some of the working pieces on our, in our state. Um, as an organic grower myself, um, you know, we had to, we had on a time when we didn't think we were going to have any early season sales uh, we shifted to online buying and it seemed to have worked pretty well for that first two months of the period. Then when, when agritourism kicked in, it really devastated our, our business. And, and um, so we need to like uh, make sure that other people who have these same issues are getting, are making sure they can fill out the application correctly. There is problems with the application. It is difficult in a lot of ways to do um, I have uh, my business, I, I can't survive without a bookkeeper. So uh, with her help, I think it took us three hours to get this form filled out. And uh, we got kicked off like multiple times. I mean, so most of us farmers who are working and are running in and trying to spend a half an hour or an hour on this form and then coming back, going back to the field, doing things, you know, this should be a way to save all the information that are on this form. So you don't have to start over every time. And that's what we noticed. It, you know, it took us more than a week and a half to fill it out, to get it filled out and sent in because we just didn't have the time to do it. And that's where most farmers are at today. They don't have as much help as they used to have because the cash flows, unless they got a really good market change, has gone. Um, but I've talked to farmers who have CSAs. I've talked with farmers that are doing maple. I've talked to farmers that are doing livestock. You know, across the board, you know, people need help. And, and I, I appreciate you guys' effort to try to make this happen for everyone. I would strongly suggest, and I, you know, my, my original reason to be on the call is dairy. And I'm hoping Mary's still on to let you guys know about the problem with the applications that, that she's come up with. Um, but we need to make sure that if you can extend that deadline, most of these farmers are not going to be able to get to know September milk till, till October. So when you have a deadline in October 1st, you know, you're not hitting all this stuff. Um, I'm hoping Mary's on. Mary, are you on? Hey John, here, can you hear me? 
<laughs> yeah, could I pass it off to Mary right now to talk, to give you a little discussion about that? Um, I would really appreciate that. Bobby, you Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you, Mary. Bye. Ruth, did you have a question of Joe right now, or do you want to wait until um, Mary finishes her testimony? I can wait for Mary. Thanks, Bobby. Okay. Go ahead, Mary. All right. Well, again, thank you all. And I think this is a very important conversation to have, and we are glad that Farm Bureau could be a part of it. I just want to touch base a little bit on what's going on in the dairy um, application specifically. A lot of people are having similar issues to what I've heard today with loading documents, um, untimely responses, and just trying to get the application done during one of our busiest times of year with haying um, and everything else that comes with uh, getting ready for corn harvest. So I know we got the recent report that only 20% of the funds have been used. Um, most of the people I have talked to are waiting until September because they wanna be able to capture the full loss What's happening as well is organic dairy farmers are applying for this grant and getting approved as well, um, which is a good thing if they're experiencing any losses or any extra expenses. So it's not just conventional dairy. This does reach across the board, but we want to make sure that we're getting those dairy farmers all the resources they need to apply. And I would strongly encourage to extend the deadline because as we mentioned, the September milk right now, we're still operating under COVID restrictions for milk production and a new thing in the last few months that we haven't had before is the producer price differential. So that's locally based in the Northeast and we're actually not able to capture the full value of the market in our milk price because of this differential. What it's doing is there's too much, um, it goes on the fluid milk per, for your region and based on cheese sales. So we're actually seeing a negative PPD come out of our milk checks right now. Um, and we expect that to continue uh, for a few months so we're not out of the woods yet by any means, and we appreciate the opportunity to apply for the application, but dairy farmers, again, we're, we're really under the gun right now to get crops in. Um, a lot of people are waiting till September, so I do think that a lot of these funds will be used. And from everyone we've talked to right now, from the date of application to the actual payment is about four weeks. So there's a significant lag in time when we're looking at that. So I think there's a lot of money on the table right now that is probably already spoken for um, even within, you know, just yesterday. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, are there, uh, Ruth, did you, you had a question, Ruth? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to Joe and something he said, because it's the first time I've heard it. Um, there are clearly a lot of issues with the technical ability to fill out this application and you mentioned that you're not able to save the application midway through like if you don't finish it in one sitting you lose what you've put in there is that is that what i heard that's that's what we experienced so uh, whether that okay. whether i did something totally you know my abilities of the computer and all that if um whether it's something we did or not did but mm -hmm none of the information saved once we filled it out at all. You had to go back through the whole thing again. And not that the form is is totally inept. It's just, there's a lot in there that, you know, if, if you're busy, you, you never, it didn't save. So okay. for our instance, it didn't save. I'm not sure if other people have had the same experience, but, and I just know with, uh, with my, personal business and Farm Bureau issues and things to handle. I don't really get a lot of uh, three hours to sit at the computer very often um, as I, you know, to get this stuff done. So uh, especially when it's paperwork, because, you know, I want to be right back in the field with somebody right. else. Of lab. course. Andrea, <laughs> can you just be really quick to confirm yep. or deny the saving application thing? Yeah, I can clarify because I sat through the webinar that the agency offered to people who are going to apply. There is a feature of the online form that you have to complete a page in right. order to get it to save. If you stop in the middle of a page, you lose everything. And it's not, apparently it's not really obvious that that's how it works, but that is okay. what they said. Okay, well, I find this a little ir ironic that one of the reasons we're having a hard time figuring out how to modify this is because of an expensive software developer 
who developed an application that you can't even save. So um, that's um, problematic. Just, just clear, and, and just to be clear, you can save it. You just have to do it at when you get to the end of a page. Right. You have to do it at the exact right time. But if you have right. to run out and you know, yep, milk your cows or get the hay in before it rains, you might not have the luxury of of being able to stop at the right time. Um, so that seems problematic and something that we hadn't heard. We had this, the Senate Education, or sorry, Agriculture Committee has talked with the agency about the deadline. And one of the things that we were considering and the agency seemed amenable to was November 15th to change the deadline for all of the programs to then and that they would have enough time um, to get everything processed. So that would give people a lot more time and hopefully be able to work through some of these. And I don't know if it's helpful or possible to ask them to, to offer a paper application because I know not everybody has access to the internet sufficient at their homes. Um, but uh, it's good to hear that this is another issue that's come up for people. I mean, not good to hear, but interesting to hear. So thanks. I think there would be, excuse if I can speak. Um, Bob, I think, you're muted. I think that this would be um, beneficial to some producers who are not so readily available uh, on the computer. I mean, I know there's a places they can go get help, but uh, how many of them will? And if it was uh, a not not just online application, I think it would be, I think it would be beneficial. Yep. Other questions for for Joe or this is uh, this is not a question, Bobby. But one little oh, and and John O'Brien did have his hand up. But one little thing on the application that I will add is that <clears throat> once you finish the page on economic harm, if you move forward to the next page and you go back because you want to add something, I was not able to do that. It wasn't critical, um, but um, it's something that anybody filling this out, if anybody's watching this and wants to know, once you move to that final page where you check off all of the um, things you agree to and understand, you can't back up and um, change your narrative about economic harm. Huh, yeah, it's weird. So John uh, had his hand up. Yes, John O'Brien. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, I was thinking back to our testimony on the dairy side of things in June, uh, when we were hearing of, of the enormous losses to the to the dairy side of things, and that that even the caps we were putting in place were only going to cover, you know, I don't know, probably some people on this know know better, but maybe ten or twenty percent. They you know nobody was going to be made whole by by these COVID relief funds. And so I was thinking, is there is would there be a way? And Michael. Um, O'Grady might have some ideas about this. Would there be a way to, to just completely simplify the, the diversified agriculture and, and say, you know, if you made $100,000 selling carrots last year or, or maple syrup, if we just said, okay, you're going to get 15% of that. We understand you're not going to be made whole. Let's just declare all farms in Vermont have suffered some sort of economic harm and base it on, say, last year's gross sales, you know, something really simple so that we spend this money. Because I think we've seen here, it's if we're worried about fraud or people who made a little money, somehow they were just in a sweet spot. Uh, it's really minuscule. And, and the more important thing is to get this money out because it's a bridge just to, to a, a post-COVID time. Are you, are you still with us, Michael? I, I'm here. I, I think you could do that, but my concern would be exhaustion of the funds uh, relatively quickly. Um, you're, you, the agency has always said they don't know how many non-dairy farmers there are. Um, and they've estimated it at approximately 2,000 to 3,000, right? Because that's in the neighborhood of how many people have claimed farming income. With $5 million and a designated percentage of previous year's revenue, I think you probably exhaust that money quickly. I'd wanna to talk to Nolan about that at JFO. Um, 
but yeah, you can do that. That's, that's not hard from a drafting perspective. And um, you could characterize it as for reimbursement of expenses due to COVID. Um, but I'd be concerned about the <laughs> amount of money that would be available. Well, and the size, you know, the size of the farms, different farms would make a big difference. Um, maple producers, there's some that, you know, do a tremendous amount of syrup and some that do, you know, 100, 100 uh, gallons or 200 gallons. And uh, yeah, it would be tricky to, to do it that way, I think, John, but um, you know, we're all ears. We can we can visit about it and try to uh, look at it and see, you know, both sides of the issue. Yep, I mean, we're sort um, we're sort of doing that with the dairy side of things. You know, the well, LFOs yeah. are eligible for a lot more than the small certified, for example. Yeah, the uh, Ruth. Yeah, I mean, John, I I. Uh, I'm sympathetic to that and was thinking along the same lines, but um, we, when we created those um, categories, it's because exactly what Michael said is that there are way more farms and we're still not sure how many farms. Um, so we had to create some kind of tiered system like we did with dairy so that there wouldn't be a few big farms that came in and got all of it, especially since we only had a very limited amount of money for this. Um, you know, the non-dairy farms, but I agree that the caps are, you know, especially since the maximum is only $20,000, that's, that's problematic because it's, it's much lower than other grant programs, including the working lands. So there certainly is an incentive to go for the working lands if you can. Um, and so I, I, you know, it's certainly problematic, but there was uh, a concern that the money would be blown through with just a few farms um, if we didn't have the tiered system, like, and, and the same with the dairy. So are there other questions from committee members of uh, Joe or Mary? Um, Carolyn, anything else uh, from your side? Are you gonna... Mm -hmm. Have you sent your letter? No, you haven't sent your letter yet. You said you've got to get your committee to vote on it. I, I think they've contacted me um, and and it's going to be sent. It's got to be sent by the end of business today. Uh, we've sort of finalized it. And as I said, we um, I, I think that the solution to this is going to take a little bit more discussion at, to reach um, to reach something that really works. So um, I think, and we've been asked to weigh in on, as I said earlier, numbers of two approves, not so much uh, policy. Uh, I think it makes sense for us to continue to work on this. And I think it makes a lot of sense for us to work together. You're muted, Bobby. Bobby, you're muted. There you go. You really like to hear me, don't you? I didn't mute you. <laughs> you muted yourself. <laughs> um, well, um, see, as far as I know, what's going to happen, there's going to be a general uh, bill uh, made uh, an amendment to the COVID funding programs. And we're going to be part of that larger bill. It won't be part of the budget. It'll be a, a separate uh, adjustment to the COVID funding proposal. And so uh, we're gonna have to get our amendments and Michael has already put together uh, several uh, sections of that, our proposal that we're going to give to approach to to follow through on. Michael, has you shared that with the house at all? I have not. No. The um, maybe uh, maybe you could as long as you guys 
all crazy in the house and and amend our work that we're doing, but we could certainly work together to add some additional language to our proposals that we're going to forward to our appropriations committee. And uh, it would be helpful if if you guys could, you know, work on that and and uh, take part in it because we're going to need, um, you know, both sides have got to agree to it in the end anyway. So it would be good if we could all agree on the ag, at least the ag stuff and, and move forward. Well, I would agree. I think it's a great idea. And um, I think that we've asked some questions here that yeah. are important. Um, I think moving the date is probably not a problem. Um, yeah. Michael's already got that in our draft. Okay. And then the question about, can we eliminate the question about the W-2 employer, employee rather, um, I Michael, think is important to ask. Michael's, Michael's gonna investigate that, right, Michael? Yeah, but I've already, um, I think it's a CARES Act requirement, but there's been some uh, hubbub about removing it. Uh, I know David Hall has been talking to AC, the, to the Senate Economic Development Committee about removing it for the ACCD programs. Um, so it's it's something that I'll have more information for you on probably later today or tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so um, so the date, see um, the W two issues a, an issue. Uh, uh, the other is moving the money from from uh, the farm program to working lands to avoid that particular issue. How much, you know, how much should we move or leave that up to the agency to decide as the funds are, are you know, being uh, paid out. Um, so we've got plenty of things that uh, we can work on within the next, uh, I would expect, um next week will be will be the tell time uh i know um the president pro tem said that once the budget's done we're going home uh regardless of what's left on the table so um if you got did your committee get done with the uh appropriations bill did you say that carolyn yes they, they no, voted did. out or? Oh, our probes is not finished. We finished oh. our recommendation to a probes. Oh, okay. So we've still got then a, a week or, or two because once we get the bill, it's going to take us a week or so to wrap it up. Yeah. So we're, we're good until probably uh, midweek next week to get our stuff together. Right. Uh, what Do you think that timeline is somewhat accurate, Michael? So, yeah, I think that's probably pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, so you'll, you'll keep working, Carolyn, with your side and uh, we'll, we'll keep uh, doing our thing and we'll, uh, we'll communicate on how you're doing and how we're doing so, next week. So Bobby, I, I actually have a question to ask um, and and I don't wanna start any firestorms here. Uh, I, what I, I, I guess what I want to understand uh, and, and, and if Mike can share your suggestions with us, that would be a good starting place. But does anyone here feel that um, people who have not lost money, who may have been doing well, uh, and and you know at this point see that they're going to prosper in some way, um, be able to apply for this COVID money. Why? Well, my quick answer is why would if anybody's doing well, why would they apply for it in the first place? Why not leave it for the people 
that aren't doing so well when you only got a, uh, an amount that's only going to cover maybe 20, 25% of the losses anyways. Well, I, I agree with you. I understand that. But then we hear about the unemployment situation where people were kind of trying to, you know, get extra money. There was fraud, supposedly fraud going on. So um, I, I just want, you know, like that's, that's a, and I, I see part of this problem is this timeline crunch where a lot of us who are a diversified ag won't maybe know until December whether they are really in hot water or not. Uh, and, and yet there's this, uh, this requirement that uh, applications be in and, you know, and the money be spent or at least expended by the agency by a certain date. And so I don't like it, um, but, um, you know, I'm just wondering how we handle that. What's fair? Well, I mean, uh, uh, Ruth? I think what's fair is that we create this program or amend this program to be the same as all the other economic development grants that we've put for other types of businesses. And they don't have this kind of requirement. And we've made it more difficult for um, the non-dairy diversified farmers, whatever you wanna call them, um, this sector of agriculture than we have for other sectors of agriculture and other types of businesses. So bringing this program more in line with the other programs, that's what's fair. And in yeah. terms of the, the, the accusations of fraud, I think they've been overblown and that most people are doing, they're doing what is, right for their business and for their family and, and trying to make ends meet during a pandemic. And um, I think that there are plenty of, uh, you know, guardrails in place for these programs. There's a, you know, full state system in place. Um, and we just wanna make sure that the farmers get the, the help that they need and make this as flexible and um, easy, accessible as possible. And that was, that was where we were trying to head with the draft that Michael has started on, on our side. And it would be great if we could all agree on that on both these committees. Yeah. Uh, that sounds good, Ruth. Uh, I will say also, and I wonder if you included anything about um, paper applications. I will say applying for this really tested my skills. Uh, everything I've learned about computers has basically been taught by my kids. <laughs> or learned from my kids, but um, it it was it was challenging, and I was I got inventive with screenshots of emails, you know, on my phone of emails from both sheep and wool festivals saying that they were the they were canceled in order to prove it. Um, so I'm wondering if the uh, a paper copy is available for any of uh, this. Also, I, I noticed that John Bartholomew's hand is up, but. Anyway, I don't think there is a paper copy available, but I think that's certainly something we should ask the agency of because we've heard that in other testimony that there are farmers who don't even have internet access. So even if they had computer skills, they don't have internet access. So I think right. it's, it's problematic. Yes. Um, Michael, Michael tried to get us a paper copy, but once you get to a certain point, it kicks you out if you don't put in certain names and numbers and all yeah. this we couldn't even print a we couldn't even print a form um well, so well, that, go ahead mike, Di mike diane said it it might it would be difficult to print uh, a paper copy because of formatting she didn't say it was impossible um so i i don't know if it truly is impossible but it, it would be difficult um, and so that, that's, that's, I know you're trying to cut Solomon's baby here. You want something that's easy and accessible and that the agency can implement quickly. That's an online application, right? Yeah. To move yeah. money. If, if you're going to be asking the agency to be processing a thousand paper applications, that's not gonna happen quickly. 
So maybe the answer, Mike, for folks who don't have computer access or don't have computer skills is to contact uh, VHCB and ask them for help. Well, that's, that's what's supposed to happen. And they take their iPad right with them and go meet with the farm and fill it out on, I believe, on their, their iPad or, or, yeah, their laptop. Yeah. So I'm saying this for the sake of anybody who might be watching. Uh, I noticed that John Bartholomew's hand is up. John? Um, I'm really hesitant to use the federal government as, as an example for anything, but I, sh I want to point out that um, when, the, when they gave the payments out to taxpayers, there was really nothing, nothing that looked at need whatsoever. Um, they just sent the money. Um, so just another approach. Yeah, well, they have a, they have a printing press uh, that just keeps pumping the money out down there, which we don't have. So we're going. Yeah, but that, that's where the money came from. It is it is federal money, so it's it came from their printing press. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I just were, wanted to point it out as an example of another approach. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, yeah they, but but I got to tell you that that system is based on on IRS tax computers, right? You put yeah. in your social security number. They can check what your AGI was last year. They can check if you were listed as a dependent last year. It, it, it's, it's not just that they cut you a check. I know people that were, were denied because they were dependents. My next door neighbor's kids were denied because they were dependents last year. And so it's, it's, it, it wasn't just they cut a check. There, there was. No, I know, I know. But my diligence. my point is, my point is that it wasn't based on need. Money right. just came, and they have no idea whether the person who got the money needed it suffered any loss. Right. Well, there are people who earn too much money to qualify for those payments too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and but remember that that you're talking about two different pots of money. Yeah. The, the money that went out from the federal government, the 1200 and 500 was an economic impact payment that was basically characterized as a tax credit, right? It was just a credit. You just got the money if you met all the criteria. The CRF funds that went to states are to pay for expenditures related to the oh. coronavirus outbreak, right? Right. And, and it, it's it's two different pots of money, two different criteria. Yeah, understood. So anyhow, um, we'll uh, we'll move forward and uh, uh, with our work uh, on both sides of the House and Senate, and hopefully um, uh, by next. Uh, Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, something like that, uh, we'll, we'll be able to put our proposal together. Maybe, um, maybe we should set a deadline. We could work on this. Uh, so maybe next Thursday, we should try to wrap everything up between, between the, us and the groups. Uh, uh, Bobby, um, we have a meeting, uh, an uh, a committee meeting on Friday morning uh, from 8.30 till 10 or 10.30. So we could work on it then. Yeah. So you could kind of get your thoughts together for next week then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ruth, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to know if we're going to do a, another joint committee hearing because I, I do think given the history of this proposal, that it would be helpful to have our committees work on it together in like as together as this kind of thing is these days <laughs> um because uh then we'll we're we'll know for sure we're all on the same page um because this is too important to get messed up between communication um and we need to do this fast so i guess i'm just putting in a plug for another joint meeting of just the committees without 
necessarily a ton of testimony, but just trying to work it out, having obviously Michael, maybe Nolan, if that's necessary, and maybe somebody from the agency who can talk to these questions about technical issues with the application, um, but really just getting this language done between our committees as quickly as possible. I think that's a great idea. And I think Linda was suggesting that we hang on so that we can maybe schedule something. I don't know when you all meet uh, again. I think we're pretty flexible um, in terms of our committee. So, um, you know, we, as I said, we do have a meeting Friday morning at 8.30. Can't remember whether it lasts till 10 or 10.30, but um, I think we're on the floor at 10 on Friday. So um, if, if that coincides with something you all can do, um, glad to do it. Well, we, we will probably meet um, Friday morning if the committee members can make it, uh, but we, we've got to talk about where we want to go as a committee before we meet with, with you folks so that we have a little game plan. Oh, geez. I thought that was the whole idea that we work together so we all are on the same page. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's hard to do that with 12 or 15 people, uh, you know, all of us, but uh, I, think, I think maybe later, what, are you scheduled for all morning or? Yeah, uh, I, we meet at 8.30, I think it goes till 10, then we're on the floor at 10 um, until 12. Um, so if you're, if you're reluctant because you wanna, um, you wanna do your own thing, um, then maybe Mike could share with us what you have proposed so far. We can talk about that and have a, you know, have an idea, uh, a read from our committee, how they're feeling about it. I doubt that there's gonna be a lot of problem with this. Yeah. Well, the, see tomorrow we're not meeting, but we could meet Friday morning. Um, and we could, we could meet a, a, for, with our committee and maybe for uh, an hour and then at nine or, 9.30, switch over and meet up with you guys? Yeah, the only problem is I think we're on the floor of the house at 10. So that I, doesn't give us a lot of time to talk. I doubt if you'd miss much if you miss. Um, uh, no comment. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, you want to... Um, you want to schedule a joint meeting for Tuesday then? Um, yeah, I, we've got it. We'll, let's work out the details uh, when we're not streaming live on YouTube. Um, wow. We're going to be on the floor. I mean, we're on the floor every day of the week. I'm not sure exactly what the schedule is at this point. So I'm going to have to check that. I'm looking right now. Well, let's shoot for a general meeting uh, of the two committees next Tuesday. And okay. that'll give us Friday to, to work uh, on some issues and you can work Friday on, we'll, and we have Michael that's gonna be putting it all together anyway. So um, uh, we can go from there as long as, is we both agree that Michael can share information amongst the committee members. Yeah, so Bobby, we're on the floor on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Uh, then we have our committee meeting on Wednesday, 8.30 to um, 10.30. Then we're on the floor that afternoon from two to four. Thursday morning is clear. We're on the house floor from two to four. And then Friday, we have our committee meeting from, um, 8.30 to 10.30, and then the house floor on Friday afternoon from two to four. So if we can work around that schedule, um, we're glad to do it. Well, I think we have a problem. Um, we'll have, <laughs> because, you know, Tuesdays, you guys can't meet with us. Um, we could meet at 8.30 in the morning until 10. 
Well, maybe then we better. Yeah, why don't we plan on that then? Okay. Tuesday morning. Okay, committee <clears throat> heads up. Tuesday morning, 8.30. We're on the floor at 9.30, Bobby. Yeah, I was going to say, we only have one hour, but that's better than no time. Because yeah. you guys, you wouldn't want to miss any floor time. Uh, well, maybe, maybe not. Depends on what the topic is. <clears throat> yeah, we'll... We'll plan on the first thing Tuesday morning. Okay, and Mike, Mike sent us um, the the changes, um, the draft for uh, so committee. Um, I'll forward this to you, and you can all take a look at it. Okay. And if you haven't gotten back to me regarding the letter to approves, please do so immediately. John, John, and who's the other person? Terry, anyway, all right. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to have the house with us and we meet together. Uh, so really do some serious thinking about where we're going to try to fix this. And <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll see you all Tuesday a.m. Great. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, thank you.